Bubble Chum by Windy Meadows Narrated by Lily Jane Chapter 1 What are you doing, Mom? Zack leans over my shoulder to peer at my laptop screen. I'm looking at candy recipes for Christmas. I point to the image in front of me. This one looks amazing. Look at those swirls of color. Don't you have enough candy choices for Christmas? He asks. Why do you want to make your own when you can just order it from one of your suppliers? Some of it is just so cheap and generic. I shut the computer and move down the counter to the register. People are so used to the same old thing every year. I could make some really good candy in seasonal shapes and colors to introduce something new into the market. I think people would appreciate that. He shakes his head and clucks his tongue. Don't you have enough to do without making your own candy? I swear, Mom, you're a sucker for punishment. I laugh. Maybe. I was just looking at some of the supplier catalogs for Christmas, and it's all the same old candy canes and gingerbread men. What's wrong with that? I like candy canes and gingerbread men. You're 20 years old, sweetheart, I tell him. You've had 20 Christmases in your life. When you've had 45 of them like I have, maybe you'll be over candy canes and gingerbread men. But your customers are younger, he reminds me. I'll get candy canes and gingerbread men, but I think I'll try my hand at some new varieties, too. It'll be fun. He bites back a grin and turns away. You and your experiments, Mom. I can just see our kitchen now, with caramel dripping from the light fixtures and taffy splattered over the walls. I don't laugh. I gaze off into space, thinking things over. That's just the thing. If I'm going to sell candy I made myself, it has to be made in a commercial, certified kitchen. I wouldn't be able to do it in our kitchen at home, and we don't have a kitchen here in the store. So much for that brilliant idea, he remarks. I don't answer, but I'm not ready to let go of this idea yet. Why should Christmas come through the mail in a tin? Why shouldn't I make my own candy to spice up the holidays? An iron-gray sky covers West End, and freezing wind blasts down Main Street. The town cowers in semi-darkness, inching through December to the distant light of Christmas. Down Main Street, my fellow businesses sport their early decorations, a huge painted Santa's sleigh with five reindeer decorates the front window of Maria Luisa's nail salon. Tinsel and lights highlight Horace Bentley's used bookstore. Zack takes off his apron. I'm leaving now, Mom. I'm spending the night with Gilly, so I won't be home until tomorrow. Okay, sweetheart. Have a good time. He gives me a peck on the cheek and leaves me with a sinking heart. Why do I get wistful every time he leaves to spend time with Gilly? Why should I begrudge them time together while they're young? I can't stand around moping over someone else's life. I have too much to do myself. I turn my mind to my own Christmas decorations. I'm the candy store, and I let a bookstore and a nail salon beat me to the punch. I'd better get on the bandwagon now. I turn away to go get the decorations out of the storeroom when my doorbell jingles. I look over my shoulder to see Stacy Koontz from the Happy Go Lucky Cafe and Simone Peretti from the antique store come in. Stacy glows as usual. Margaret, just the person we're looking for. You found me. What can I do for you two? We're getting ready for the winter carnival, Simone tells me. We want you to help us organize and pass out flyers to advertise. 
What winter carnival? I ask. Stacy gasps out loud. Do you mean you don't know what the winter carnival is? I never heard of it before. The two women exchange glances. This is outrageous, Simone huffs. It's only the biggest event in West End's year. It takes place in the third week of December. And tourists come from all over the eastern seaboard to participate. All the stores on Main Street set up displays, and the carnival ends with a huge bonfire on the beach on Christmas Eve. It's a big deal. Sounds like it, I remark. What do you want me to do? Welp, Stacy claps her hands. I was thinking this year we should up the ante. In the past, all the stores on Main Street set up tables and displays along the sidewalks, kind of like we did with the street fair, but even bigger. I was thinking this year we should have decorations and angels and garlands strung over the street and a big tree with lights down there by the entrance to town from the highway. That sounds great, I agree. I don't think it sounds great, Simone counters. I say we put the tree at the other end of the street near the daycare center. What for? Stacy argues. We want people to see our best decorations when they first drive into town. Some of them won't go anywhere near the daycare center. Besides, Elizabeth Bartholomew would hate to have the tree in front of her premises. How do you know? Simone asks. Have you discussed it with her? Have you gone around and poisoned everyone in town against my idea? How could I do that when I didn't even know what your idea was? Stacy asks. You never told me you wanted the tree there. Well, you never told me you wanted the tree near the entrance to town, Simone returns. If I had known that, I never would have agreed to help you organize the carnival. I hold up both hands. Hold it right there, you two. It's the first week of December. We can't start arguing over Christmas now, or we'll spoil the whole holiday season. I'm sure we can work out where to put the tree. Yeah, Simone grouses, near the daycare center. No, Stacy fires back, near the highway entrance. I move between them. Did either of you ever think someone else in this town might have an idea about where they want to put the tree? The tree is a good idea, but we should talk to the other shopkeepers about where to put it before we make any definite decisions. In the meantime, you can put me down to help out in any way. Just let me know what you want me to do. The first thing we need to do, Stacy tells me, is to design flyers to pass out. The first thing we need to do, Simone snarls, is to decide where to put the tree. It sounds to me like neither of you should be involved in deciding where to put the tree, I interject. They both round on me with sour faces. I see the situation crumbling before my eyes so I change the subject. Maybe Zack can design the flyers. He's getting into design these days. I'll ask him. I take the two women by the elbows, one in each hand, and steer them to the door. You two have a good day. We can talk more about the carnival.
I hustle them onto the sidewalk and let the door swing closed behind them. I retreat into the candy store with a relieved sigh. That was close. The winter carnival sounds like a lot of fun. Now I definitely have more motivation to make some new, exciting, inventive candy to sell to the tourists. I go back to the storeroom and get down the boxes of decorations. I haul the first one to the front when Detective David Graham enters. He smiles at the box in my hands. I wondered when you would get into the holiday spirit. I wondered if we were going to have a Grinch manning the candy store this year. Grinch? Me? Never! I love Christmas! Stacy and Simone were just in here telling me about the winter carnival. It sounds like a blast. By the way, they want to set up a big town Christmas tree, and they're already arguing about where to set it up. I think you should inform the police there might be domestic unrest around the holiday preparations. He makes a face. Thanks for telling me. I'll alert the riot squad. Do you want a hand with that? He takes the box out of my hands. Before I can stop him, he dives in and kisses me. Hey, what was that for? Just because. He manhandles the box onto the sidewalk outside the store and sets it on the concrete. Do you have a stepladder to put these up? I duck back inside and throw on my heavy winter coat along with my scarf. That wind is more bitter than I realized. When I get back from the storeroom retrieving the stepladder, I find David inside the store. You don't have to stick around. I know it's cold out there, and I can put up the decorations on my own. If you're going up on a ladder, I am definitely sticking around, he informs me. You have a nasty habit of getting hit over the head at the worst possible time. Besides, I came over here to ask you out to dinner tonight. You did? I look around at him. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Because the idea of seeing you climb up a ladder to hang Christmas decorations was too entertaining to pass up. The corners of his mouth twitch at the thought. Well, go on. I don't want to do it now with you hanging around watching. I didn't think I would have an audience watching and waiting to see me make a fool of myself. He breaks into a full grin. All right, I'll leave you alone, as long as you go out to dinner with me tonight. Of course I'll go out to dinner with you tonight, I tell him. What is it this time, the happy-go-lucky again? Heck no, it's not the happy-go-lucky again, he snaps. I was planning to take you to the Overlook. My eyebrows fly up. The Overlook Hotel? You mean the one on the beachfront? That's the one. They have a great restaurant, and you can look out over the channel with the lighthouse lighting up the ocean beyond. I used to go there with my wife. As a matter of fact, I took her there when I proposed to her. I freeze in my tracks. You're not going to propose to me, are you? He laughs out loud. That laugh fills the whole store and shakes the dust off the rafters. That would be pretty foolish of me when we just had that conversation the other day about enjoying our independent lives and not wanting anything to interfere with that. I blush and look away. That wasn't the other day. I don't say it out loud, but we're both thinking it. We had that conversation before our disastrous breakup a few months ago. He's trying to take it easy on me, now that we're back together. He doesn't want to rub my nose in how impulsively I dumped him over something that wasn't even his fault. It doesn't matter when it was, he murmurs. We said it, and we both meant it. I'm not inviting you to the Overlook to propose to you. It's the nicest restaurant around if you don't want to drive to Peterborough. You've lived in West End almost nine months, 
and you still haven't been there, so why not? I straighten up to face him. I would be honored to go out to dinner with you at the Overlook Hotel. I'm flattered that you would ask. He eases close to me, slides his hand around my back, and pulls me against him. I wouldn't go with anyone but you. He kisses me again, slower this time. I'll pick you up at seven. He turns around and walks away. Chapter Two I gaze through the store window to where David disappeared. Wow, I think. Just wow. He wants to take me to the place he proposed to his late wife. This is huge. He played it off like it was no big deal, but I know better. For a start, he never even mentioned going to the place before. He took me on picnics. He took me to the happy-go-lucky. He took me to restaurants in Peterborough. He never went anywhere near the Overlook with me, in his mind or in reality. He must have preserved that one spot in his memory, especially for her. He probably expected never to take anyone there again in his life. Now he's taking me there. That alone tells me a lot. I did the right thing getting back together with him. It took a leap of faith to admit I made a mistake calling him a liar and a cheat. But now I couldn't be happier. We're closer, and this date proves it. I go back outside. The wind numbs my cheeks within seconds, but I have to do this. I can't let another day go by without putting up my Christmas decorations, at least some of them. I take a string of garland out of the first box. I lay it along the sidewalk in front of the candy store. Then I get out my hammer and a box of nails. I take a nail out of the box, and it falls out of my grasp. I fumble for it between tingling fingers. I can't get a good grip on it in this cold. I struggle to control my hands and climb up the ladder. I press the nail's point into the wood near my gutter. I can't feel the nail, my hands are so cold. I work my hammer into the correct position, swing, and the nail drops out of my grasp. It tinkles on the pavement just as the hammer strikes my fingers, still pinched on nothing against the wood. I almost drop the hammer in shock. I shake out my injured hand and howl, all the while trying desperately not to fall off the ladder. Thank goodness David isn't here to laugh at me. I inch down the steps and collect my nail. When I take hold of it, the frigid metal seeps more icy tendrils into my flesh. This is nuts. I put down the hammer and nail next to the ladder. I make sure to put them down rather than slamming them down in a fit of juvenile frustration. This is my first attempt at putting up Christmas decorations. I can't let a little cold deter me. Christmas is supposed to be fun. The cold is supposed to add a dimension of fun and fortitude to the experience, isn't it? I march back into the candy store and get out my gloves. How I'm supposed to hold a thin nail with gloves on, I have no idea. But by golly, I'll do it for the sake of Christmas. I sure wouldn't mind someone standing around making jokes, though. That would make it easier somehow. As if in answer to my thoughts, I catch sight of David on my way back outside. He stands across the street by the bookstore talking to a tall woman with sweeping blonde hair talks to him next to his police cruiser. The puffs of steam coming out of her mouth tell me how insistently she's talking. He nods while he listens. My blood runs cold when they hug each other. Why should I mind him hugging her? 
Pauline Dunroy is his daughter Ariel's adoptive mother. Of course the two of them have to work out all the holiday logistics. Still, I cringe every time I see them together. In a way, he's closer to her than he is to me. His daughter ties him to Pauline for life. She's as close to him as if they had been married and had Ariel together. They act together like ex-spouses. They discuss drop-offs and pickups. They arrange who will take care of Ariel when. They negotiate Ariel's safety and activities. I don't like to think of myself as a jealous person, but that creeping, sickening ache in my guts can't be denied. I'm jealous of Pauline. I don't want him hugging her. I don't want to know what they talk about when he goes to her house to drop off and pick up Ariel. Oh, wait. Yes, I do want to know. I want to know every disgusting detail so I can agonize over whether he thinks more of Pauline than he does of me. Telling myself he's taking me to the Overlook instead of her does no good. Telling myself he only talks to her because he has to does no good either. I don't want him talking to her, period. I don't want him looking at her. I don't want him on the same continent with her. I turn away to my ladder. I climb up with the nail balanced between my fingers. I can't feel it any better now with my gloves on. Fortunately for me, the indentation from the point still gives me a perfect starting place. I angle it into position, and this time I don't swing the hammer at my own hand. I tap the nail lightly to get it going. Thank the stars this is working better. I get it embedded a few millimeters into the wood before I hit it harder. In a few strokes, I bury it two and a half inches. It doesn't move. I work my way down the eaves and plant nails in each of the two-by-fours, but I can't stop thinking about Pauline. She's everything I wish I was. Tall, blonde, gorgeous, rich, immaculately presented. Any man would be delighted to get her attention. How could David resist her? She sparks all my deepest insecurities. Not only does she have the looks to bend any man to her will, but she appeared in David's life at the worst possible time. I thought he was cheating on me with her. In a way, I never got over that insecurity. Not even when I knew their association was completely innocent. Not only can I not tell him never to see her again, but I can never tell him how I feel about him seeing her. That would be selfish and unfounded. I have no reason to suspect him of anything, and I don't even know her. He sees her as a necessary adjunct to developing a relationship with his daughter. Nothing more. I'm sure she feels the same way about him. Why on earth would she want to get involved with him? For one thing, she's married. I've never met her husband. I've never even seen him, but David has. Pauline and her husband raised Ariel. Their interest in David is strictly parental. Pauline comes to West End to ensure her daughter is taken care of. Still, that deep-seated resentment against the other woman in David's life won't quit nagging me. I avoid Pauline like the plague. I only ever see Ariel when Pauline's not around. Even David keeps us separate. Could he be doing that out of some dormant sense of guilt for keeping Pauline a secret from me when he did? Could he be hiding something else I might object to? I get to the end of the eaves and pound in the last nail. When I get down from the ladder, I storm over to the garland. I yank it around harder than I should. I vent my spleen against it. How did I get so angry all of a sudden? I hang the garland on the nails and stand back to check my work when a door bangs to my right. 
I look over to see Sabrina Harris come out of her bakery. She adjusts the position of her folding sign on the sidewalk. Then she approaches her front window and starts measuring it with a measuring tape. I hail her. Hello, Sabrina. Did you hear about the Winter Carnival? That sounds like a lot of fun. Stacy and Simone talked to me earlier today about getting Zach to design a flyer to advertise it. Are you helping organize too? Her head whips around and she glares at me for a second. Then she turns away and barges into her bakery without answering. I frown after her. That's not like her. A few seconds later, she reemerges with a long ruler and a grease pencil. She starts measuring, marking, and ruling lines on her front window. I stand and consider, should I try again to talk to her? Is she mad at me about something? She slaves away for a few more minutes before I make up my mind. This is my neighbor and my friend. We've been through a lot together, Sabrina and me. We've worked together on community projects before. If something is bothering her, I need to know about it. I cross to stand next to her, but she still doesn't look at me. Is anything wrong, Sabrina? Did I offend you by asking if you were organizing the carnival too? Please tell me. If I did or said anything to hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. I'll do anything to make it up to you. It's not you, Margaret, she snaps. It's those two catty witches down there. She tosses her head toward the other end of Main Street. I hesitate for a second, trying to figure out what she means. Are you talking about Stacy and Simone? So they told you about the Winter Carnival, did they? She snorts in the middle of her work. That's just rich. I furrow my brow. Am I missing something here? Are you... are you doing anything for the Winter Carnival? This is the first I've heard of it, she barks. They never told me anything about it, much less asked me to help. Those two haven't spoken to me once since I first moved into this town. I hear a lot of blather about West End being a close-knit community. But do you know what, Margaret? I don't see it. No one talks to me. No one includes me. You're the only person I've gotten to know since I moved here. I gape at her in shock. That's awful. I had no idea. She sniffs and jerks her head sideways. Never mind. I don't care. I can go it alone. I don't need them. If that's the way they're going to be, good riddance. They're just jealous because the bakery is more successful than their two businesses combined. I check myself before I answer her. Are you telling me that after the street fair, the community market, and Mr. Stewart's memorial, after you provided all that great food, they don't even talk to you? That's right. They're heartless witches. She casts another furious glare over her shoulder toward the offenders. I rub my chin. That is really odd. I know Stacy and Simone. I wonder why they're doing it. Isn't it obvious? She fires back. They blame me for Alan killing Scott Freeman. They're ostracizing me because he got sent up for murder. They don't want me here. I shake those thoughts out of my head. I see her as a drowning person, floundering in the waves. I have to throw her a lifesaver. I can't believe that. But I'll tell you what, Sabrina. We're not going to let it continue one more day. You and I are going to do this winter carnival together if it's the last thing we do. She spins around. What do you mean? I take a step toward her and touch her arm. Listen to me. I have some great ideas for some new Christmas candy, 
but I need a commercial kitchen to do it. What do you say? We could work together, and we could do a joint display table for the carnival. Her mouth falls open. Are you serious? Of course. You're part of this community, Sabrina, as sure as I'm standing here. We're going to do this, and we're going to show West End that you're one of us. Everybody knows me, and if they want to have anything to do with me, they have to take you into the bargain. Come on, let's do this together. Her shoulders fall, and her ruler hangs limp at her side. Okay, Margaret, I'm with you. Great. I squeeze both her shoulders and hurry away, but I don't go back to the candy store. Chapter 3 I walk past the candy store to the happy-go-lucky cafe. I count Stacy Coons, one of my closest friends in this town. If anything is going on between her and Simone that set them against Sabrina Harris, I need to know about it, right here and now. I stride into the cafe and stop near the register. I wait until Stacy comes over. She beams at me out of her round moon face. Having lunch by yourself, Margaret? As a matter of fact, Stacy, I tell her, I need to talk to you. Is this a good time? I know you're in the middle of a shift here. Her face falls. What's going on? Is it serious? I look around. I don't think you want to talk here in front of everybody. Can we go into your office? She leads me to her office in the back and closes the door. She rounds on me with her face as white as chalk. Don't tell me it's another dead person! I hold up my hand. Just hear me out, Stacy. You and I have been friends for a long time, and I need the truth. Is there any reason you excluded Sabrina Harris from planning the Winter Carnival? Her mouth drops open. Excluded her? What are you talking about? She says you never went to see her about the carnival. She says you never even told her about it. I asked if she was helping organize, too and she says she never even knew there was a winter carnival before now. Is there some reason you and Simone didn't go see her about it? Do you two have some reason not to like her? I like her! Stacy shrieks. I love Sabrina! How can you say such a thing? She says no one likes her. She says no one in town ever even talks to her. She says no one has made any effort to get to know her or to include her in the community since she first moved here. That's because she's always working, Stacy cries. She works like a mule every day from before dawn until long after dark. I never see her out of her bakery. The only times I've seen her at community events, she's been working twice as hard. She's always mobbed by customers because her food is that good. You know how she is, Margaret. She really needs at least two more employees. She and Tanya alone can't handle the workload, but she insists on doing all the baking herself. She'll drive herself into an early grave if she doesn't lighten up. I blink at Stacy. She's right. Sabrina always works hard. Too hard. She's a perfectionist and never lets anyone do anything for her. She takes pride in her baked goods, and with good reason. She drove herself to the breaking point for months trying to make her bakery a success. She probably doesn't realize that it is one and that it's time to hand over some of the responsibility to more employees. I swallow hard. She thinks people blame her for Alan killing Scott Freeman. She thinks the town is ostracizing her because Alan got sent up for murder. Stacy lets out a strangled cry. No! Never! My God, does she really think that of us? I nod. It sounds like maybe she blames herself. 
it sounds like she's projecting her own guilt onto the rest of the town. Stacy spins away. I'm going over there right now to talk to her. I have to tell her. Wait. I grab her arm. Don't do that. Why? Stacy yells. I can't let her go another day believing that. Just hold on a second. There's a better way to do this. How? She asks. I want her to feel at home here. I want her to... She breaks off, and her eyes swim with tears. I can't stand thinking about her going all this time thinking that about us. I have an idea, I tell her. She and I are going to be working together on the Winter Carnival. I suggest we use that as a way to bring her back into the fold. Telling her might not work, but showing her will. We'll all work with her to make her a part of this community. Stacy gulps back tears. All right, we'll do it your way. But just so you know, I want you to come and tell me anything we can do for her. If she needs anything to make this work, you come to me, understand? I give her a hug. You got it. I head back over to the candy store. On the way, I see Sabrina sketching on her front window with her grease pencil. There she goes again, doing everything herself. Any other business owner would hire a professional painter to paint their window, but not Sabrina. I return to the candy store and set up my laptop on the counter. I scroll through the pages I bookmarked with the Christmas candy. Now that I know I can make it in a commercial kitchen, my ideas start flowing. There I go again, getting ahead of myself. This must be what Zack is talking about. I'm always taking on some new thing, even when I already have enough to do. Still, when I look around the candy store, I see a whole lot of the same old brands. Some of these candy brands have been around for 50 years. People might like their old favorites, but they like variety and new things, too. What better time to experiment than at Christmas? I get out a piece of paper and start taking notes. I jot down a list of all the candies I want to make and tally up the ingredients I need. I'm starting to get excited about this when the doorbells jingle again. David and Ariel enter, along with a breath of crisp air. It smells pungent and fresh, unlike the stale cold I remember from when I hammered those nails. It almost smells like... I don't want to say it. I don't want to think it for fear I'll jinx it. It would be wonderful, though, if we got snow for the carnival. That would be frosting on the cake. David hugs his heavy coat around his shoulders and slaps his chest with both hands. It smells like snow out there. Shh! Ariel hisses. You'll jinx it! I put my arm around her. That's what I say too, sweetie. You can't jinx snow, David replies. That would defy the laws of physics. If it's going to snow, it will snow whether you talk about it or not. Ariel and I look at each other and roll our eyes. He just doesn't get it, she remarks. He's one of those flat earth types, I tease. Don't pay any attention. What are you two doing in here? Rotting your teeth in the middle of the day? Yep. David chirps. We decided to pick up some candy to take on our hike with. He jerks his thumb over his shoulder and stops short with his mouth still open to say something. I cast a single glance in the direction of his gesture and spot Pauline waiting next to David's car across the street. My blood runs cold in my veins. So he's going hiking with her after asking me out tonight. 
I shouldn't be jealous of her. Their relationship is strictly platonic. At least, it better be. I am jealous, though. I don't want him going out with her. I want him going out with me. I should be the only woman in his life. Besides Ariel, I mean. My gaze skids sideways back to his face. He stares down at me, with his mouth still ready to say her name. They're going for a hike with Pauline. They came to the store to get some candy. He shuts his mouth, and his expression changes. Anyway, what do you want to get, sweetheart? Ariel rushes to the counter. I'll get one of those trays of wrapped sweets and three candy canes. I force myself to laugh it off. I can't let her see I hold any animosity toward her mother. That's not a very healthy lunch. I hand over the candy. Thank you, Margaret. She tucks the tray under one arm and beams up at me. Her face shines with youthful innocence and vigor. She would never believe she could inspire so many competing emotions in the adults around her. She never will know if there's any way I can possibly avoid it. I wish you were coming with us. Can Margaret come with us, David? We both jump in at once, making excuses. I have to stay here and man the candy store, I tell her. I don't think that's a good idea, David blurts out. She peers up at him. Why not? Can't Zack cover the store just for a little while? David and I exchange glances. He starts to say something, but I get there first. I don't think I would survive outside in this cold for more than 40 seconds anyway. You go on ahead. I'll see you all later. Her face falls. I won't see you. I'm going back to Hartford tonight. Mom's driving me home as soon as we get back. This is the last time. Oh, sweetie. I put my arms around her again. This isn't the last time by a country mile. I'm going to be around to worry about your dental health for a long time to come. You'll be back up here for the winter carnival, won't you? Look at the candy I'm planning for our display. It looks pretty awesome, doesn't it? She stares down at my computer screen with wide eyes while I run David's credit card through the register. You're doing all that? I just hope I can get it done in time. So the next time you come up to visit, you can help me out. Sabrina and I are combining forces, and I also have to do some promotion, so I'll need all the help I can get. Be careful you don't take on too much, David warns. You're going to have a lot more business over the holidays, and you don't want to overwork yourself. I won't overwork myself, I tell him. Besides, many hands make light work. With me and Sabrina sharing the load, it will be much easier. I hope you're right, he remarks. Friends who work together stay together, I tell him. Or something like that. Don't you mean... he begins. Oh, never mind about that. Ariel grabs his arm. Come on, let's go. She hustles him out of the store and across the street to meet her mother. They leave me all alone with no one to talk to, but I suppose I shouldn't mind. I wouldn't want to be around Pauline anyway. I couldn't trust myself to behave properly without showing my resentment toward her. Chapter 4 Oppressive cloud hangs over the rest of the day. It occludes not only the sky, but my mind as well. Here I molder in my boring candy store, while David has a great time with Ariel and Pauline. Life leaves me in the dust where I belong. How can I compete with Pauline? She doesn't have to work. She always shows up in West End looking like she stepped off the pages of Vogue. She hugs David right outside my shop window 
where I have no choice but to see them. By the end of the day, I sense myself sliding into a deep, depressive funk. No one knows. No one cares. No one stops by to see me. I'm utterly alone in the world. I lock up the store after work and slouch home with my muffler bunched around my face. That's me. Faceless. Formless. Soulless. The overcast sky dampens every sound. I get home to find a note on the entry table. Don't forget I'm spending the night at Gilly's, Mom. Don't wait up. Zach. I pitch my keys on the table and haul my exhausted carcass to the living room. This is just great. Tonight is not the night I need to be alone in the house. I flop onto the couch and fling my arm over my eyes. I would lie here all night if I didn't get hungry but I'm still too low to get up and do anything about it. I get out my phone and waste an hour on the internet before a text comes through from David. On my way over now. I blink at the screen. What is he talking about? Why is he on his way over now? Why did he say it like that, like I should know exactly what he's talking about? I have to think hard and rummage through my memory banks before I remember. The date! I launch myself off the couch faster than a speeding bullet. I completely forgot he asked me out on a real, special, fancy date to the Overlook Hotel. I got so wrapped up in feeling sorry for myself that I completely blanked out the part where he planned to take me to the same restaurant where he proposed to his wife. I rocket upstairs, stripping off clothes as fast as I can. I dive into the shower and soap up in record time. When I get out, I leave a trail of wet footprints tiptoeing to my room to get dressed. I hurry through the process and fuss with my hair, all the time keeping my eye on the clock. What time did he say he was going to pick me up? I finish just in time to hear his car pulling up to the curb. I snatch my knitted shawl and race downstairs, just in time to open the door, like I knew all along and had plenty of time to get ready. He smiles at me. You look ravishing. I blush. Or is that all the running around I've been doing? I extend my hand to him. Thank you. You look smashing, too. He certainly does. He wears a tailored black suit with gold cufflinks and shiny, polished black leather shoes. I've never seen him like this before. He offers me his arm and escorts me to his car. He seats me in the passenger side and gets behind the wheel. We start out of town on the highway and he heads toward the beach. I struggle to come up with something to say. How was the hike? He turns his piercing blue eyes on me. Not as nice as this. I've been looking forward to this all day. I try to look away, but my cheeks burn. He can't really mean that. Did Pauline and Ariel get off to Hartford all right? Not quite. They had a flat tire, so I changed it for them before they left. Other than that, they got away fine. I look out the window at the scenery. My guts churn, thinking about him changing Pauline's tire. Of course he would have to play knight in shining armor to her while I was trapped in the candy store. I should have known something like that would go on behind my back. I lock my teeth. I tell myself again and again, don't say anything. Just don't say anything. We drive in silence for a while before he speaks up. Do you want to talk about it? I shouldn't, but since he already knows something is bothering me, keeping quiet would probably turn out to be just as messy. 
Not really. Do you understand why I didn't want you to come on the hike? I let a shaky breath. Of course I understand. I didn't want to come on the hike. I just wish it was different. I wish I had you all to myself instead of sharing you with anybody. I have to spend time with Ariel, he points out. I'm not talking about Ariel. I press my hand to my eyes. Oh, for the love of God, yes, I am talking about Ariel. I'm talking about everybody. It's foolish. I know it's not rational. It's stupid and childish, and I never wanted to talk about it in the first place. Just ignore me. I won't ignore your feelings, he returns. If something is bothering you, we should work it out. Nothing is bothering me. I'm perfectly fine with you spending time with Ariel. What about Pauline? He asks. Are you perfectly fine with me spending time with her? I snort with laughter. Yes, I'm perfectly fine with you spending time with her, too. I have no reason not to be. Spend all the time you like with her. Just... He waits. Just what? Just don't stop spending time with me, okay? Don't forget about me. Without answering, he seizes the wheel and careens off the road. He skids to a halt on the shoulder and swivels around in the seat. He grabs my hand. I will never stop spending time with you, and I could never forget about you if I tried. You are far more important to me than Pauline. I can't necessarily say the same about Ariel, but I will never put my relationship with her above my relationship with you. I will always make time for both of you. I nod down at his big, warm hand, protecting mine in his grasp. Why did I ever question him? I should have trusted him. Pauline isn't even in that equation, he goes on. She's not even on the charts for me to spend time with her. Only Ariel matters. Ariel and you. You're the only two women in my life. I understand that. I guess I just needed to hear you say it. I'll say it as often as you need to hear it. He presses my hand and goes back to driving. Just so you know, I don't think she's all that amped to spend time with you, either. My head spins around. What makes you say that? She never mentions you. She never talks about you. If Ariel or I mentions you, she either keeps quiet or changes the subject. That's odd, I remark. I barely know the woman. Why would she have any reason to dislike me? I don't know. I thought it was kind of strange, since she knows we're dating. Ariel can't say enough about you, and it obviously bothers Pauline. She never shows any negative emotions. She always stays calm and friendly and civil. But just the way she avoids talking about you made me think maybe she doesn't like you. I frown. Most people who don't like me have some reason for it. Like I put them in prison or something. I can't think of anyone in my life who developed a dislike for me without getting to know me first. I don't like knowing some woman out there resents me and avoids the mention of my name. I want to track her down and confront her. I want answers about her messed up attitude. Then again, maybe she feels the same way about me. Maybe she caught the hint that I was jealous of the time she spent with David. Maybe that made her uncomfortable, and she resents that I resent her. I settle back in my seat. My relationship with David certainly didn't turn out the way I expected. It started out simple enough. I enjoyed dating a handsome man with no competing responsibilities to get in the way of him bestowing all his free time on me. Now, here we are in this mess. He has a daughter and a... I almost called her his ex-wife. 
She isn't, but she might as well be. I have to consider her in the same category as if she was his ex. Her being his daughter's adoptive mother doesn't change the dynamic for me. She's the fifth wheel. She's the other party in raising Ariel, and he has to negotiate with her over everything as if they had raised Ariel together. David has as much sexual interest in her as if they had broken up long ago. At least, I hope he does. How much sexual interest does Pauline have for him? Maybe none. Maybe it's all in my mind. After all, she's married. He turns down the beach road. It winds a long way on the edge of steep cliffs. I can see out over the black ocean writhing cold and lonely to the limit of the horizon. A cruel winter wind howls over the whitecaps and pounds the beach below. Far into the distance, high above our heads, a beacon of light shines its penetrating rays into the gloom. It burns like a star for all the world to see. It offers a glint of hope in the icy wilderness of storm-swept sea. I can't think about my petty troubles with that lighthouse drawing us closer all the time. The car plows ahead until the headlights find the source. We pull into a parking lot flooded with welcoming golden beams. We're here, David tells me. I wrap my shawl close around my shoulders while I wait for him to open my door. I get out into the biting gale. He immediately wraps both arms around me and hustles me to the hotel. He bursts inside and slams the door behind us. In an instant, the noise dies, and I find myself tucked in a pocket of heat and comfort. Candlelit tables fill the restaurant. A few diners clink their silverware and sip wine from sparkling glasses. Huge windows afford a magnificent view over the beach and the ocean. This place must look just as stunning in daylight as it does at night. David exchanges a few words with the concierge, who takes us to our table. I can't stop staring at everything. This place is spectacular. I knew you'd like it. I look at the cloth napkins, the crystal wine flutes, the place settings with three consecutively smaller plates stacked one on top of the other. You have never brought any other woman here? No, I haven't. The concierge brings over a bottle of wine, pops the cork, and pours for both of us. After he leaves, David raises his glass to me. This place is special to me, and if you have anything to say about it, I won't bring anyone else here. I lower my eyes to my wine while I sip. He'll never bring Pauline here, or any other woman. This is all for me. The more I drink in the surroundings, the more special it becomes. No one has ever done anything as special as this for me, and his words make it so much more so. Now I understand how he feels about me. The waiter takes our order, and eventually we start on the mind-blowingly good food. How can I have been living in West End all these months and not known a restaurant as good as this existed a few miles from my house? I'm glad I didn't know, so tonight could be as special as it is, but I can't stop my head spinning every time some new astonishment takes me unawares. In the middle of the meal, the concierge comes over to our table. He bows to David. Is everything to your satisfaction, sir? It's perfect. David waves the man toward me. 
Margaret, I want you to meet Marvin Jetty. He's the owner of this fine establishment. Marvin, I don't think you've had the pleasure of meeting Margaret Nichols. Believe it or not, the man actually bows over my hand and kisses my knuckles. Your reputation precedes you, Miss Nichols. Thank you, Marvin, I reply. This hotel is certainly an accomplishment to be proud of. Congratulations. His cheeks flush, and he closes his eyes when he bows his head. It's a very humble little hotel. We do our best to make it nice. If it pleases the guests, that is all I ask. He bows himself away from the table and leaves us alone. I shake my head. He's entirely too humble. He built this place with his own two hands, David tells me. He used to wait on every table before he got too successful and had to hire help. He still works the floor, though. He forms personal connections with every customer and guest, and he takes personal responsibility for everything that happens in the whole hotel. Now that's what I call service. No wonder he succeeded, I remark. He is certainly attentive. If you need anything, anything at all, you ask him. He knows everybody and has his fingers in everything. Some of his guests walk in the door with special requests. He prides himself on taking care of their needs, as long as it's legal. I shoot him a sidelong grin. I was going to ask how you can be friends with him if he gets them anything they want. He leans back in his chair and sips his wine. He calls me if any guest requests anything illegal. He knows if they can't get it from him, they'll look elsewhere, and that's how they get into trouble. Most of his guests know the drill by now. People who are into anything illegal don't come here, or they just keep their mouths shut. He's smart, I remark. He certainly is. He protects his business. Chapter 5 I bend over a baking sheet lined with parchment paper. I concentrate hard to pipe hot, sticky candy into identical swirls. I work as fast as I can to make seven rows of twenty each before the candy starts to cool and harden. At the table next to me, Sabrina pipes red icing into flower clusters on another sheet. When we finish, we meet at the walk-in fridge to put both trays on the shelf inside to cool. More than 50 trays already fill the walk-in. We're running out of room, I point out. We'll be fine, Sabrina tells me. Just keep working. By the time we fill up the walk-in, these will be cool enough to package up. We can also use the fridge under the prep bench over there if we run out of space, which we won't. I saunter back to the work table in her bakery kitchen. We've been at it for four hours, making candy, chocolate, and baked goods as fast as we can, while Zach covers the candy store and Tanya works the bakery counter. I pipe another row before I run out of candy. I drop the piping bag into the sink and head for the stove. What are you working on next, Margaret? Sabrina asks. I'm going to make the gingerbread walls for the gingerbread houses. I have four big houses planned, so I need those big flat pans of yours. I fish under the counter and lay out the wide, flat cake tins on the work table. Whoa, girl! Sabrina calls. Back the truck up a second. You don't even have the batter made yet. Leave those down below and leave some workspace for me. I laugh out loud. Sorry, I'm not used to working on a commercial scale. Well, I'm not used to working with another person in my kitchen. I'm used to hogging all the space and all the pans and all the walk-in shelves to myself. She chuckles and shakes her head. Thank you for letting me use your kitchen, I tell her. I know it isn't easy letting a stranger and an amateur into your workspace. I'm grateful. She cocks her head to look at me. 
I like it. I didn't realize until now how lonely I was working alone. I measure my next words with care. Why don't you get yourself a few more employees? You shouldn't have to work your fingers to the bone morning, noon, and night. You're successful enough now that you should be able to delegate a little more. You're right, Margaret, she tells me. Thank you. I didn't think of that either. I love baking and I wouldn't want to stop, but I wouldn't have to. I would just have a couple more people around to share it with. Great idea. Thanks. In the few seconds since I mentioned the idea, she already looks lighter, happier, almost relieved. You did an amazing job taking over this bakery after Alan got arrested, I tell her. You should be proud of yourself. You made it the success it is, and everyone in town admires you, not to mention that they love your food. I'm glad they like it. I only wish they'd... Before she finishes speaking, the back kitchen door bursts open and Stacy Koontz enters. She beams at both of us covered in chocolate and candy and dough. Zach told me you were over here. I got the flyers printed. She holds up a piece of paper printed in bright colors. Winter Carnival, it reads. Bonfire at the Beach, West End, Connecticut, December 20th, 2019. Wow, Stacy, I exclaim. Those look amazing. Did you design them yourself? Her cheeks bulge and glow even rosier than usual. It's a little side hobby of mine. Now we just have to distribute them. I was hoping you could help me out. We have to cover the businesses in town, both neighborhoods, and the... I can't leave now, I tell her. I'm just about to start my gingerbread houses. Can you do that later? She asks. The carnival is only a week away. I can't, I tell her. I got Zach to cover the store so I would have the whole day off. I don't know when I'll have time to do it if I don't do it now. You go on, Sabrina tells me. I can finish up for you here. I look back and forth between them. Then I make up my mind. No, I'm going to do this. I set this time to make my stuff, and I don't have any free time set aside between now and the carnival. It's now or never. Sorry, Stacy. Okay, she shrugs. I'll wait for you to finish. Great. I jump on my gingerbread and slide the pans into the oven. I wrap some baking sheets in foil and start preparing the icing and candy for the houses. Stacy leans against the counter. What are you up to, Sabrina? I'm making the frosting decorations for some big wedding-style cakes, only they'll be more like tiered Christmas cakes without the bride and groom standing on top. See? She turns her three-ring binder around on the table so Stacy can see the sketches of Sabrina's cakes. Stacy's eyes pop. Holy cannoli! These are stunning! You guys are really going all out. We want to make a good display for the carnival, Sabrina replies. Stacy sets her hands on her hips. That does it. I'm going to have to up my game if I'm going to show my face next to you guys. I wasn't planning anything special for my display, but I can see I'm going to have to change that. She flips the plastic-covered pages in Sabrina's notebook, ooing and awing over one sketch after another. I glance at Sabrina. She bends over her piping bag, but her face shines as red as a beet. She can't escape the implication of this conversation. Stacy really admires Sabrina's work. Hey, Sabrina, I chime in. Maybe Stacy could give you some tips on where to find reliable employees. I turn to Stacy. Sabrina is thinking of bringing in a few more hands to share the load. Stacy jumps a foot in the air and points at Sabrina. Yes, I've got just the thing. Sabrina blinks at her. You do? 
You bet. Do you remember Mary Turtletob who worked for me last summer? She left to go back to Hartford, but just the other day, she showed up at the cafe asking if there was any way she could get her old job back. She moved back to West End and wants to settle here. I had to tell her no, but that if I had any openings, I'd call her first. Then, about ten minutes later, Jennifer Monahan told me she was thinking of leaving the cafe. She usually does the baking for me, but that only takes up maybe three hours of her shift at the most. She has to wait tables and work the salad station, too, and she doesn't like that. She said she wants a job doing only baking, and she was going to quit. Well, as you can imagine, I got down on my knees and begged her with tears in my eyes not to leave. I said I didn't know what I'd do without her and a lot of other things I don't remember. My point is, I could train Mary to take her place, and you could have Jennifer. She loves baking, and she really takes it seriously. She'd make a great employee for you. She's super reliable and honest. She's been with me nearly three years. She's a model employee, especially when she likes the person she works for. Sabrina picked her jaw up off the floor. Wow! Thank you so much. That would be perfect. Stacy flaps her hands at her. It's nothing between neighbors. Share and share alike, I always say. Besides, you deserve a really good employee. You need one. You're like me. Your business is in their hands. If they don't produce, your customers will leave. Your food has to be top quality. You don't want to hand over responsibility to someone who doesn't take that seriously. I observe the exchange between them with satisfaction. Sabrina's finally getting the memo that people in this town understand her and care about her and her business. The conversation turns to other matters while I finish the gingerbread houses, or at least get them into a condition where I can leave them for a little while. At about two o'clock in the afternoon, I take off my apron and wash my hands and face. Sabrina is still hard at work when Stacy and I leave the baker's dozen and get into Stacy's car. I slam the door and she fires up the heater. We motor through the wintry streets. Does it seem like there aren't many tourists around? I ask. What if not very many people come to the carnival? What if we go to all this trouble and it turns into a dud? Don't you worry about that, she replies. It's always like this. Early December goes real quiet, and then whammo! As soon as the carnival hits, the tourists start coming out of the woodwork. They all land on West End in time for bonfire at the beach, and after that, it's open season until the end of January. The last few years, the police have had to supervise traffic on Main Street because so many tourists crowded the town. We even had community meetings to decide if they should shut down the town to vehicle traffic and make everyone walk because the cars and bikes and stuff were endangering all the pedestrians. That's incredible, I exclaim. It's hard to imagine West End getting that busy. It will happen. You mark my words. It always does. You're lucky you have Zack and Patty to work your store. If I was you, I would start training them up to prepare them for the busier times ahead. What will they have to do then that's different from what they do now? I ask. For a start, you probably want two people working the counter at all times instead of one. One person couldn't handle all the customers you're going to get. I study the side of her face. Are you sure it will get that busy? She nods. I'm already organizing my extra staff for the holiday period. I suggest you plan accordingly. She drives to the western neighborhood. We put a flyer in every mailbox. Then we do the same thing in the eastern neighborhood. Stacy turns the car back toward town, but she doesn't angle into Main Street. She merges onto the highway. Where are you going? 
I ask. To the Overlook Hotel. Marvin, the owner, usually lets us pass out flyers there. I say nothing on the trip out to the Overlook. The beach road certainly looks different in the daylight, but I'm not exactly sure if I should go back to the hotel. That's David's special spot. Our special spot. Should I go there without him? What could be the problem? It's not like I'm going on a date there with another man. I'm helping Stacy distribute flyers for the carnival. Hopefully David will understand. He definitely will. It's myself I'm not sure about. I still haven't made up my mind what to do when Stacy parks in the parking lot. It's decision time. Either I can accompany her inside or stay in the car like a fool. I get out, and we breeze into the restaurant where Marvin stands behind a podium. He raises his eyebrows at both of us. Do you ladies have a reservation? I think I would remember seeing you on the guest list for lunch. We don't have a reservation, Marvin, I tell him. We came to ask you if we can distribute flyers for the winter carnival around your hotel. We wouldn't dream of intruding without your permission. But of course. He puffs out his chest and smooths his pristine white waistcoat down his stomach. You are welcome to place a stack of flyers on the front desk, and you may put one under each room door, too. You know the routine, Stacy, I trust. Yes, thank you, Marvin, Stacy replies. We really appreciate your generosity. He closes his eyes and bows. Anything to help West End. We leave the restaurant, and Stacy shows me to the hotel entrance. We find a tall young man in his twenties behind the front desk. Ah, Kevin! Stacy exclaims. Do you know Margaret Nichols? He gasps. Not the Margaret Nichols, not the private investigator. Before I can reply, Stacy cuts in again. As big as life, but we're not here to investigate anything. Marvin told us we could put some winter carnival flyers on the desk. Uh, of course. Kevin gawks at me. It's an honor to meet you, Miss Nichols. Could I get your autograph? I fidget from one foot to the other. Sure you can, Stacy interrupts. Make it out to Kevin Flew, Margaret. She arranges the flyers on the desk while I scribble my John Hancock on a scrap of paper for the flabbergasted Kevin. What's wrong with him? I whisper to her as we walk away. Nothing's wrong with him. He's a very nice boy. Now you take these flyers and put them under all the doors in the south wing while I take the north. Which one's the south wing? I ask. How do you know I won't get lost in this place? Just head over that way. She points behind me. You can't get lost. The hotel isn't that big. And if you're not back at the front desk in 15 minutes, I'll come and find you. She walks away. I never distributed flyers in a hotel before, so here goes. I slot one sheet under every door. I fall into a rhythm. This is easy. Some of the doors have their do not disturb signs out. I don't see any guests. I work my way to the opposite end of the south wing and begin coming back on the other side. I get halfway down it and bend over to slide a sheet into room 237. My knuckles brush the door, and it creaks back. I straighten up to pull it closed, but I have to put the flyers back into my left hand to do that. When I finally secure them in a way that won't flutter all over the floor, I put out my hand for the doorknob and freeze. A man lies on the bed inside the room. From the threshold, I see his head lolled over the side of the mattress. The skin of his face resembles scoured leather the color of blood. Puffy, blood-filled swelling disfigures his features, and his swollen tongue hangs out of his mouth. His glazed eyes stare at nothing, and one livid hand 
claws at his shirt collar. The fingers remain hooked under it in desperate futility. I stare at him for a second. He's beyond dead. I can see that without entering the room. I take a moment to consider what to do. Should I call David? What if he finds out I went to the Overlook without him? That's all fiddle-faddle. I'm a grown woman. I can go where I want, and David knows it as well as I do. I yank out my phone and steady my hands to type out a text. There's a dead body at the Overlook Hotel. It doesn't look like natural causes to me. Send. In a second, a return message comes through. If you found the body, I'd say it almost certainly isn't natural causes. I'm on my way. Stay put. He ends with a heart emoji. He really knows how to cheer me up. Chapter 6 I hover in the hall and watch the forensics team work over room 237. David mingles among them for a while. After a time, Marvin appears from the restaurant, and the two men talk in low tones. Why doesn't David invite me in to help out? The longer I stand around doing nothing, the more I start to imagine the worst. Is he mad at me for going to the Overlook? Is he upset about something else I did? Just then, Stacy strolls up. Did you pass them all out? Then she sees what's going on. Oh, no. I'm afraid so, I murmured. I put a flyer under the door and it swung open. There he was, as big as, well, as big as death. Her expression clears and she nudges me with her elbow. I might as well take off then. You and the detective will be here working the case for a while, I suppose. Before I can answer, Marvin leaves the room. He walks past us, heading downstairs. A few seconds later, David shoulders his way between me and Stacy to follow Marvin. I shift from one foot to the other. It looks like I might be sitting this one out. If you're leaving, I better go with you. You can't sit this one out, she snaps. You're the town investigator. You're as much a detective as he is. She waves toward where David disappeared downstairs. I shrug. I'd like to think so, but if he doesn't want me on the case, there's not a lot I can do. Just stick around a couple more minutes, Stacy, please, until I figure out what's going on. You bet, she replies. Just let me know what you want me to do. I ease my way down the corridor. I dread finding out why David is being so standoffish. I come to the landing overlooking the main entrance. About thirty people stand around in the foyer downstairs. David moves from one person to the next. He talks to them all, but he keeps his voice low, so I can't make out the words. One after another, he finishes with them, and they leave, until only he, Marvin, and Kevin Flew, the desk clerk, remain. They huddle together, all talking in animated whispers. If I'm ever going to find out what the dickens is going on, I better do it now. I summon my courage and walk down the stairs. I make sure to stay perfectly calm and composed, on the outside, that is. When Marvin sees me coming, he nods to David and leaves. Kevin scuttles behind the desk and pretends I don't exist. I approach David. What's going on? Do you want me to help you investigate? I've got this, he replies. You go on home. I'll get in touch with you later. He starts to turn away. I gape at him in shock. He did not just say that. He did not just dismiss me with a wave of his hand. I lunge forward and grab him. Hey, what's going on? Why won't you let me help out with the investigation? You never shut me down like this before. He lowers his voice, but it doesn't soften. 
His features take on that hard, unyielding character that tells me there's no budging this man. I'm sorry, I can't let you get involved. Not yet. I have to preserve the integrity of the investigation. Now please, go home. When I am able to fill you in, I will. He spins on his heel and marches away. I stand rooted to the spot and blink at his disappearing frame. What just happened? Did he really just shut me out of an investigation? My whole world crashes to the ground. Can it really be true that we built our flimsy relationship on the comfort of sharing these cases with each other? Was it all a lie when he said he appreciated discussing his work with someone who understood? Was he just shooting sunshine up my skirt when he said I was a good investigator? I stumble sideways in a confused stupor. Stacy appears at my side and grabs my arm. What was all that about? I can barely get my constricted throat to work. Nothing. Let's get out of here. She drives me back to town in a daze. I can't for the life of me figure out what David meant by his comments. I can't even start to conceptualize this case because I know nothing about it. That's the worst part. If I could puzzle it out and maybe decipher what happened, I could make sense of it all. Stacy pauses at the turnoff to West End. Do you want me to take you home? No, I rasp. Take me back to the candy store. She parks in front of the happy-go-lucky. I gulp hard. Thanks for the ride. Sorry it turned out the way it did. She pats my hand. You let me know if you need anything else, okay? I nod and turn away. I don't want anybody being nice to me right now. I turn my steps to the candy store, but I veer off to the bakery instead. I get inside and find my unfinished gingerbread houses on the workbench. Sabrina's out front serving customers. I carry the gingerbread houses back to the candy store and set them up on a table in the storeroom. I take one to the front counter to work on it there. Zack's eyes snap open when he sees me. You're supposed to be having the day off. I need to drown my troubles in work. I hope you don't mind. Patty Matthews comes in, sweeping the back steps. Ah, Margaret, that is one mansion of a gingerbread house. Mom's sulking about something, Zack informs her. She's here to hide from life. I glare at him. I'm not sulking, Zachary, and I am not hiding from life, so I'll thank you to keep a civil tongue in your head, young man. I couldn't hide from life if I wanted to. Then what's the trouble you want to drown in work? He asks. By all means, share it with the rest of the class. I found another dead body, I tell him. Some tourist turned up dead at the Overlook Hotel, and I found the body. I've been up there for the last hour. That should be right up your alley, he remarks. You're never happier than when you're chasing some murder. Now you and Detective Graham can unpuzzle the whole thing together. Congratulations. That's just the thing. I don't think David wants me working on it. He looks up at me, and his eyebrows quiver. What do you mean? You two always work together on these cases. Up until today, I would have said you were right, but this is different. I'd like nothing better than to work on the case, but he doesn't seem to want me to. He didn't invite me to look over the crime scene with him, and he sent me home without telling me anything about what was going on. He completely shut me out. That's not like him at all, Zack mutters. I wonder why he did it. I don't know. I turn back to the gingerbread house and start sticking candies onto it. I glue them in place with icing. Either way, I have enough to do without a murder case gumming up the works. I have a lot to do to get ready for the winter carnival. 
Patty waves her index finger around the store. Are you going to be here for a while, Margaret? If you are, I'll take off. I have things to do at home. Sure, you go ahead, Patty. I'll help Zack. She heads for the door when I call her back. Oh, by the way, everybody says traffic will pick up around here during the holidays. Stacy recommends we put two people on every shift instead of one, so in the next week, the three of us need to figure out which of us will be working when. She's right, Patty agrees. Good plan. She leaves me and Zack alone, and I concentrate on my gingerbread house to try to forget everything that happened at the hotel. Zack doesn't say anything to disturb my focus, and I almost succeed in shrugging the whole incident off when David shows up. He lets himself into the candy store the way he usually does. He stops in front of my gingerbread house and watches me stick the candies into place. Are you going to have a little miniature Hansel and Gretel in the front yard nibbling the peppermints? I bite back a grin. I didn't plan on it. What's up? He glances back and forth between me and Zack. I need to talk to you for a second, Margaret, in private. Okay, sure. I wipe the frosting off my hands and lead him into my office. I leave the door open out of habit, but he closes it behind me. When he faces me, I cringe at the look on his face. What's this all about? I need to ask you a few questions. Is this about the case? I ask. He holds up his hand. I said I need to ask you a few questions. Save your own questions for another time. This is important. Okay, fire away. I need to know where you were last night, he tells me. I gape at him. Then I burst out laughing. Is this a trick question? You know where I was last night. He doesn't laugh. He doesn't even fight back a smile. His brows knit in black, smoldering ferocity. Just answer the question. Where were you last night? I give a nervous laugh, but this situation grates on my nerves. How can he ask that after everything that happened? I was with you, you big dope. I was on a date with you at the Overlook Hotel. Or have you forgotten that already? I haven't forgotten, he booms. I mean, after that. Where were you after our date? I was at home. My voice quavers. I want to cry, but I fight to hold it all together. I can't let him see how much this upsets me. I was home all night after you dropped me off. Are you sure? He asks. I throw up my hands in mock exasperation. This is crazy. I don't have to play these stupid games. I make a bid for the door, but he straightens one arm in front of me to block my way. His expression menaces me with that looming threat that tells me not to mess with him. Stop right there. Can anyone corroborate that you were home all night after I dropped you off? I open my mouth to make some excuse, but at that moment... My mind flits back to last night. He dropped me off at 9.30 at night. Zack wasn't home. He was spending the night with Gilly. I was all by myself until I went to work this morning. I let out a heavy sigh. No, no one can corroborate that I was home all night. I was alone the whole time. David turns away. What's this all about? Is this about the case at the Overlook? I can't tell you that yet. I'm sorry. I have to do a little more legwork. Then, hopefully, I'll be able to tell you. If it is about the case, I offer, why not let me help you? I thought you liked sharing your cases with me. I say it, hoping I'll get at least some human reaction out of him. Maybe an easing of the strain around his eyes or mouth. Anything to throw me a lifeline. Instead, 
he stiffens against me even more, if that's possible. I do enjoy sharing cases with you, but I can't share this one with you. I'm sorry, I have to go. He opens the office door. Oh, by the way, have you been back home to your house since you left the hotel? No, I came straight here. Why? I need to search your house, he tells me. I need to send the forensics team over there, and I need to tell them if you've been there since the body was found. I haven't been there. So, do I have your permission to search the house? He asks. If you don't give permission, I'll have to get a warrant. That will take time, but it will still happen. I put on my big girl panties and stare him down. I wall off my upset behind an impenetrable wall of granite. I would never let him see me upset over this. I would save that for private. Go ahead and search it. I have nothing to hide. I only wish I knew what you were looking for. He turns his back on me. I'll let you know the minute we find anything. I stand still long after the doorbells tell me he's gone. Cold numbness creeps up my legs into my heart. I can't move. What the devil is going on? Why is he acting like this? Why is he questioning me about my whereabouts when he knows perfectly well where I was and what I was doing? None of this makes any sense, and his behavior makes it so much worse. He could have said one word to encourage me, to let me know he still cared about me, no matter what the problem was. He didn't even bother to do that. None of the events of the last few hours make any coherent picture I can understand. The quaking heartache that started to take over wells up in my middle. I sense it threatening to take over and knock me off my moorings if I don't do something pretty quick. What can I do, though? I can't work on the case. I can't work on the Winter Carnival. There's nothing I can do and nowhere I can go to get away from it. I throw out my foot and kick the office door shut. I'm alone. No one can see me or hear me. I return to my desk and sit down in my chair. I stare at the desktop for a second, trying to make up my mind what to do. Should I go home? Should I go for a walk? My throat swells. I can't hold back that tide of despair a second longer. But the good news is, I don't have to. I fold my arms on the desk, bury my face in my elbow, and burst into tears. Chapter 7 Time to go home, Mom, Zack calls. Just a second, I yell back. Don't leave without me, okay? I'm waiting. I carry my now-completed gingerbread house to the bakery next door, stash it in the walk-in, and hustle back to the candy store to meet Zack on the sidewalk. He locks up, and we head for home. We take our time strolling down Main Street and into our own neighborhood. Even if things aren't as great as they could be right now, I still enjoy the crisp winter air, the bare black trees against the sky, and the dead leaves lining the sidewalks. There's something comforting about winter cold when you know you're going home to a warm house with all your own comfortable things. I slip my hand through Zack's elbow. If I can't be near David right now, at least I still have one man in my life. I cherish my son more than ever, especially since he's got a girlfriend and his own life is leading him away from me. I have to enjoy the time we have left while it lasts. He buoys me up in a sea of despair. I hold on to him to save my life and stop me from drowning. All at once, Zack stops in the middle of the sidewalk. He gasps out loud. What the? We both stare in shock at our house. Whatever I envisioned about going into a nice, warm, comforting house flies right out the window. The white forensics team van is parked in our driveway. 
white-jacketed men and women swarm all over the place. David Graham stands on the porch, jotting something in his notebook. His eyebrows bristle when we walk up the steps. I'm sorry, but you two will have to stay out here until we finish our survey. What's going on? I ask him. I told you we had to make a thorough search of the premises, he replies. This could take maybe another hour and a half to two hours. Two hours? I cry. You said you had to search it. You never said you were going to do all this. I wave at the forensics team pouring out of every door. They even dig around in the yard. He frowns over his notes. It's a standard search, nothing you haven't seen before. I've seen it before, but it never happened to me and my house before. I stare at the faceless horde rummaging in every hole and corner. I don't even want to think about what they're doing inside. I don't want to know what they're finding and what conclusions they might come to. Zack and I retreat to the sidewalk. I can't watch this. I turn away. A sick feeling eats away at my insides, and I huddle inside my coat. The comforting welcome of home that I anticipated slips through my fingers. Now that I have nowhere to shelter, the cold sinks into my bones. It gnaws at my nerves until I can't stand it. Kyle Davidson comes out of his house and meanders over to us. What's going on over there? I look away. I don't want to talk right now. Out of nowhere, Zack puts his arms around my shoulders and hugs me against his chest. I wish I could hide in that embrace from the whole nightmare. Jonah leans his ribs into the back of my legs. He presses his weight into me. I close my eyes to hold back tears. The assurance and support of my friends and neighbors means the world, but it doesn't fix what's broken. I'm homeless. I'm bereft. I've got nothing in the world. When Kyle speaks again, he murmurs low. You guys can come over to my house if you want to. I've got coffee and cake in there. Thank you, Mr. Davidson, Zack tells him. If it's all the same to you, I think we'll just wait until the police gives us permission to go into our house. Sure. Kyle breathes. Just let me know if I can help you in any way. I should have expected this. The people in this town never let anyone face any hardship without trying to help. They were bound to do the same for me. It doesn't make it easier, though, does it? I've been on the giving end of all that help and support for months. I never really understood until now what it felt like to need it in return. A rapid footstep draws our attention toward the house. David Graham comes toward us with his police officer face on. I'm getting tired of seeing that face. If I don't start seeing something different from him, I don't think I'll be able to look at him again. He nods to Zack and Kyle. I need you to come down to the station with me, Margaret. Zack whips around. What for? I need to question her some more, and I can't do it here. David waves toward his cruiser. Can't you tell us what this is all about? Kyle asks. I'm sorry, David replies. It's strictly part of the investigation right now. I take a step away, but Zack cuts me off. Don't go with him, Mom. She's not going anywhere with you until you tell us what this is all about. I hold out my hand to him. It's all right. I'll go. Zack shoves his hands into his pockets and pulls out his keys. I'm going to follow you, Mom. I'll wait so you have a ride home afterward. Good idea, David tells him. He marches toward his squad car and opens the passenger door the way he usually does. At least he doesn't put me in the back. That would be my worst nightmare. He gets into the driver's seat and rumbles out of town to the police station. He opens the car door for me. Then he opens the station door for me. 
He goes through every inch of the process with meticulous precision. He leads me inside and waves me toward a chair in front of his desk. I've never set foot in the station before. It looks different from what I expected. It's really not much more than a box out in the middle of nowhere with a few desks in it. No one occupies any of the other desks. We have the place to ourselves. He picks up a stack of file folders and sets it aside. From my seat, I can see he keeps his desk impeccably clean. He always talks about his house being a barn and a stable and a kennel for a single man. I thought his desk would be a disaster zone. Instead, every piece of paper has its own place, its own paperclip, its own designated position in his orderly system. He takes out his notebook and powers up his computer before he turns to me. Now then, Margaret, let's get down to brass tacks, shall we? It's my unfortunate duty to inform you that you're a suspect in the murder case out at the Overlook Hotel. Right now, you're our only suspect, and all the evidence points to you. What evidence is that? I ask. He shakes his head and closes his eyes. You are here to answer my questions, not the other way around. We found some very incriminating evidence in your house. Right now, it's only out of consideration for our long association and your position as a respected member of this community that you're not under arrest for capital murder. Why won't you tell me what evidence you found? I demand. If I'm going to listen to you accuse me of murder, I have a right to know what evidence you're basing that on. I can't tell you. It's a sensitive part of the investigation. So you keep saying. I grumble. Now I need to ask you some questions about what you know about the victim. He opens his notebook. I didn't know the victim, I tell him. You never met him? No, I never met him. I tell him. I never laid eyes on him until I found him dead in his hotel room. What about his wife? He asks. Do you know his wife? I smack my lips and throw up my hands. This is silly, David. How could I know the victim or his wife? They were tourists from out of town. They never even came to West End. They were in the hotel the whole time. He shakes his head. Please, just stick to answering the questions. Muddling the interview with a bunch of questions of your own only makes you look more guilty. If you really have nothing to hide, please just cooperate with the police investigation without throwing your own brand of detective work into the mix. Fine. I fling myself back in my chair. I did not know the victim or his wife. I never met them. I never talked to them. I never knew what they looked like. I still don't know what his wife looks like. Neither of them ever bought candy from your store, he asks. No, they never bought candy from my store. Do you have any ongoing medical conditions, Margaret? He asks. I gasp and my eyes snap open. What? No, you know I don't have any medical conditions. Are you on any medications currently? I glare at him. Now this is getting ridiculous. No! When was the last time you went to the doctor's office? How should I know? I fire back. I guess it was in October when I went for my annual pap smear. Are you going to subpoena the results while you're at it? I might have to, which means I'll need your permission to access your medical records. I gape at him. You're serious. You would really do that, wouldn't you? He leans his elbows on the desk. For the first time, he looks at me with something close to human decency. This is an active murder investigation, Margaret. This is not a game you play on the side. We have to look into every detail of your story for any inconsistency. So if there is anything you're leaving out, or anything you chose to alter slightly, it will only work against you. 
I narrow my eyes at him. I didn't leave anything out, and I didn't alter anything. I never met the victim or his wife. They never came into the store. What else do you know about this case? He asks. This was too much. I lost my cool. How could I know anything about this case when you won't include me? I don't even know the victim's name. He compresses his lips and scowls at me. All right, Margaret. I'm going to throw you a bone because I can see you won't cooperate until I do. His name was Diedrich Tripp. He and his wife came up here from Arlington. They always come to the Overlook Hotel. His wife had to go to New York for some beauty treatment last night, so she wasn't around until after you supposedly found his body. What does that mean, supposedly found his body? I demanded. I did find his body. Someone saw you coming out of the victim's room last night, he tells me. Someone identified you inside the hotel, in the victim's room, after eleven o'clock last night. My mind spins in confusion, trying to put all the pieces together. That's not possible! I never left the house! You said yourself you have no way to prove that. You could have left home, driven to the hotel, and seen the victim. His wife was out of town. You could have arranged some sort of rendezvous with him. My jaw hits the floor. Are you seriously suggesting I... What are you suggesting? Are you suggesting I had some sort of illicit dalliance with him? I burst out laughing at the sheer idiocy of the suggestion. You're the only man I've been with since I left my ex-husband, David. You know that. Or are you suggesting I cheated on you, too? Is that what you're suggesting? He draws himself up inside his jacket. His features make me want to hide my head under the bed covers. I have to keep my emotions out of this, Margaret. I have to follow where the evidence leads me. And right now, all the evidence points to you meeting the victim last night and then killing him this morning, followed by you pretending to find the body and notifying the police. I want to tell him again how crazy this all sounds. I want to laugh at the whole thing, but his expression won't let me. His countenance fumes with barely suppressed fury. When I look at that face, the face I thought I would never get tired of looking at, I start to experience real fear for my safety. He's trying to put me away for murder. He's trying to pin this murder on me, and he won't stop until he does. I know what kind of investigator he is. He'll leave no stone unturned. That ought to give me comfort. I ought to be glad to think he'll find the evidence to clear my name. I can't be happy about this, though. I want to disappear in shame. He turns back to his notebook. Let's get back to the subject of your alibi. You say you were home all night. I suppose there was nothing stopping you from driving out to the Overlook after I left you alone. How could I drive there after you left when I didn't have a car? I ask. Zack took his car with him to spend the night with Gilly. I didn't have a car. His eyes snapped to my face. Really? Of course. You know I don't have a car. Well, that's something at least. He makes a note of it in his notebook. My mind kicks into investigator mode. If he listened to me about that, maybe I can find some other hole in his case. Who identified me coming out of the victim's room? I'm not at liberty to reveal that at the moment. Are you sure the person was able to make a positive identification? I persist. I had never been inside the Overlook Hotel at all until this afternoon. I was at the restaurant with you for the first time last night. Maybe the person who identified me made a mistake. He shakes his head and frowns even deeper. I won't lie to you that the case has some loose ends yet to be tied up. 
I have to pursue my investigation with the same professional thoroughness as if you weren't the prime suspect. I'm sorry if this puts a strain on our personal relationship, but if you can't respect what I'm trying to do here, then maybe our personal relationship wasn't worth that much in the first place. I let out a long breath and let my chin fall on my chest. I understand. You just have to understand where I'm coming from on this. I can't just cooperate with your investigation without asking questions of my own, especially since the whole premise is so far-fetched. It might seem far-fetched to you, he replies, but in my line of work, the evidence comes first. We have this evidence. We have to accept where it points us and where it leads, regardless of whether we like the outcome or not. I glare at him across the desk. I might have to accept it, but I don't have to like it. Are we done? Am I free to go now? He nods down at his hands. Yes, you're free to go, as long as you don't try to leave town. I snort in indignation, like I would try to leave town. I kick back the chair and storm out of the station. But the truth is, I'm more rattled than angry. I can't be a suspect in a murder investigation. That's impossible. I find Zack waiting for me outside, and we get into his car. He drives me back to town. What's that all about? According to him, I'm a suspect in the death of that tourist out at the Overlook Hotel. Apparently, I was having a torrid affair with him, and I snuck out to the hotel to copulate with him while his wife was out of town. Then, for some reason, I killed him this afternoon and pretended to find the body to cover up my own guilt. Zack guffaws with laughter. That's pretty funny. It's not funny. It's just about as far from funny as possible. He says they have evidence that points to my guilt, and they have someone who identified me coming out of the victim's room last night. It doesn't look good. He said it's only out of consideration for our history together and my position as a respected member of the community that I'm not already under arrest. Zack parks the car in our driveway. When we get into the house, we find Patty Matthews and Sabrina Harris waiting in the living room. I hope you don't mind that we came inside, Sabrina tells me. We came by and found the door standing wide open. Forget it. I toss my handbag on the entry table. The forensics team guys must have left it open. Kyle Davidson told us what happened, Patty adds. You're not really suspected of murder, are you, Margaret? Yes, I am. I wish I wasn't, but it's true, and I better start learning to live with it. This investigation isn't going to go away. I throw myself on the couch, and the two women sink into the chairs opposite. Isn't there anything you can do about it? Zack leans against the door frame. Forget living with it. The best way to deal with it is to solve the stupid case yourself. It doesn't matter that you are the main suspect. It's a murder case, and you're a proven investigator. So solve it. There must be a way to show you weren't there last night, and that you didn't kill him today. I don't know how I can solve the case, I point out. David won't tell me anything. He won't tell me how the victim died, and he won't tell me what evidence he found in the house to cast suspicion on me. That shouldn't stop you looking into the murder, Sabrina counters. Zack is right. You've proven time and again you're the best person to crack these cases. Start with the evidence you have and work from there. You'll clear your name. When I think about working on this case, I can't summon the energy to do it. As much as I loved solving my last few cases, I don't want to face it now. I can't get excited about following the clues or unraveling the mystery. Why? David. He thinks I'm guilty. He doesn't believe in me, either my abilities or my innocence. 
My own boyfriend is trying to put me in prison. We could help you, Patty suggests. We could do some investigation work on this side. You could coordinate us as your team. I hold up my hand. I don't think that's a very good, yeah. Sabrina jumps in her chair. Tell us what you want us to do, Margaret. We could be like your deputies. Hold it right there. I straight up on the couch. No one is going to be a deputy anything. We're all just civilians. But you're a private investigator, Zack points out. Why shouldn't you investigate this, too? I mean, someone saw someone coming out of the victim's room last night. It wasn't you, so it must have been someone else. Who could it have been? You just said Detective Graham thinks you killed the victim this afternoon right before you found the body. Sabrina points out. That means whatever method the killer used must have acted right away. They must have done it in a few seconds. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to find the body in time. The guy must have been killed while you were in the hotel, right? I blink at her. Then I look around the room at the other two. They're right. Too many factors about this case don't add up. What am I doing moping about being a suspect when I have a case to solve? If I didn't kill the victim, that means someone else did in the time I was at the hotel. The three faces gaze back at me in rapt fascination. They wait for me to say something. Mom? Zack asks. What are you thinking? A switch flips in my mind, and I bolt upright on the couch. I clap my hands. You're right. We have a case to crack. I went to the restaurant at two o'clock in the afternoon. We checked in with Marvin, the owner, before we went into the hotel itself. I was with Stacy the whole time, until ten minutes before I found the body. That means the killer must have been in the hotel at the same time. Do you think the killer planned to murder the victim while you were there? Sabrina asks. I don't see how they could, I reply. How could they know I would be there at that particular time? The only people who knew where I was going are you and Stacy. Do you remember? I was at your bakery. I never even planned to go to the hotel at that time. I wouldn't have left the bakery if Stacy hadn't come over with the flyers right at that moment. And even then, we delayed so I could finish the gingerbread houses. So it was a coincidence, Zack added. The killer just happened to murder the victim while you were in the hotel. Except that I was supposedly seen leaving the room the night before. Either someone made a serious mistake in identifying the wrong person, or else the killer told the police I was there when I wasn't. Who made the identification? Zack asked. David won't tell me. What are you going to do about it? Patty asked. What's our first line of attack? Before we do anything or make any rash decisions, I want to go up to the hotel and ask a few pointed questions. You guys can all help by covering the candy store while I do that. Once I do, I'll have a better idea what we need to investigate. Chapter 8 Bright and early the next morning, Stacy Kuntz gives me a ride out to the Overlook Hotel. She parks in the parking lot and eyes me on the side. Are you sure you don't want me to come inside with you? I'm sure, I tell her. I appreciate you taking time off from work to come with me, but I think I better do this alone. More people will only make them uncomfortable. She touches my arm. If you need anything, I'll be right outside. Thanks, but I'm already under suspicion for murder. I don't see it getting any worse than that. I get out of the car and go inside. I find Kevin at the front desk. His eyes widen when he sees me. Uh, Miss Nichols? Don't look so surprised, Kevin, I tell him. 
I'm not here to kill anybody. I just want to ask a few questions. He swallows hard and looks sideways for something. He opens his mouth, but no sound comes out. I observe his behavior. This kid knows all about the investigation, and he knows I've been fingered for the murder. He wouldn't act so petrified if he didn't. He behaves as though he's standing in the presence of a cold-blooded killer. I shake my head. All right, Kevin, I won't talk to you about it. Can you tell me where Marvin is? He opens his mouth a few more times, like a beached fish. I won't be getting any information out of him today. I turn away from the desk, just in time to see Marvin himself pass through the corridor. He wears his restaurant concierge suit with the long white apron. He enters the kitchen and comes back with a bottle of champagne. I rush to intercept him. Marvin! He whips around and freezes when he recognizes me. Miss Nichols, what a surprise. I need to talk to you, Marvin. I need to find out what's going on that made Detective Graham think I'm the one who killed that man. I know you're busy right now, but will you please just talk to me? I have no one else to turn to. He regards me for a moment. His face fidgets with competing emotions. Then he takes a firm grip on the neck of his champagne bottle. I'm due to take this into the dining room, but I shall return in two minutes. Wait here. He walks away and leaves me in the hall. I pace around for what seems like a lot longer than two minutes until he comes back. When he does, he sweeps up to me, takes my elbow, and steers me into a butler's pantry off the restaurant. He shuts the door and murmurs low into my face. The detective would not be pleased if he found out I was speaking to you, Miss Nichols. I know that, I whisper back, and I'm grateful for any help you can give me. Do you know why he thinks I'm the killer? He says someone spotted me coming out of the victim's room, which is preposterous. He won't tell me who told him about that, and he won't tell me how the victim died either. I finish blurting this out to find him studying me from a detached distance. His mouth tightens, and he speaks in a normal voice, devoid of inflection. I'm going to tell you, Miss Nichols, because I believe you are innocent of this crime. I read all the stories about you solving those other murders, and I don't believe for a second the detective would bring you here on a date the way he did the other night if you were capable of doing anything illegal. That man has the instincts of a hawk, and he is extremely particular about the company he keeps. I knew you from your cases, but when I saw the two of you at dinner the other night, and he introduced you to me, I knew you had to be someone very special. I lower my eyes to the floor. No words come to me to answer him. I find myself falling, and many hands catch me and hold me aloft. The man you found, Marvin goes on, was killed with a lethal dose of atropine. It's a drug often used to treat irregular heart rhythms. He was on a prescription dose, but he was killed by a massive injection directly into his carotid artery. It would have acted within seconds. I gasp, staring at him. How do you know all this? Detective Graham told me. The type of atropine was not pharmaceutical grade, either. It was extracted from a plant, belladonna. That is why the victim's face looked the way it did when you found him. I can barely speak above a whisper. So, did the killer knew the victim? Did they know he was on a prescription of it? Is that what you're saying? He shrugs. Who can say? That is all I know about the mode of death. What about the person who says I was in the room? I ask. Do you know who made the identification? It was Kevin Flew who told the detective about that. You would have to ask him. I glance over my shoulder toward the pantry door. I don't think he'll talk to me. He looks like someone walked over his grave every time he sees me. Marvin gives a clipped nod. 
I'll straighten that out for you. Come with me. He marches out of the butler's pantry and heads for the front desk. Kevin's eyes goggle when he sees me with Marvin. Marvin walks right up to him and says in a clear, distinct voice, Kevin, I'm ordering you, as your employer, to tell Miss Nichols anything she wants to know about the man who was killed upstairs. Do you understand? He swallows hard. Yes, sir. Marvin faces me and waves his hand toward Kevin. Miss Nichols? Thank you. I approach the desk. Did you tell Detective Graham that someone saw me coming out of the victim's room the night before he died? Sweat breaks out all over Kevin's face. He doesn't blink, staring at me in stunned shock. Yes, Miss Nichols. Who told you they saw me coming out of his room? Kevin glances at Marvin. Then he closes his eyes and stammers out in a quivering voice. It was Mrs. Tripp. I gasp. Mrs. Tripp? Kevin nods. She said she saw you coming out of the room. She said, I just saw Margaret Nichols. She's the famous detective that solved all those murder mysteries. That's what she said to me. My mental circuits smoke in astonishment. How could she see me the night before the murder when she was in New York City getting a beauty treatment? That's her whole alibi. She relieved herself of suspicion by saying she wasn't in the hotel that night. So how could she identify me? Kevin looks to Marvin for help. He opens his mouth but closes it again without saying anything. Neither of them answers me. That gives me something to go on, anyway, but I'm not finished by a long shot. How did she know who I was? I ask Kevin. How did she know it was me? She said she recognized your picture from the papers, Kevin replies. And she never once questioned why I was in her room with her husband? I ask. She never raised any security concerns with you or Marvin or the rest of the staff that a stranger was in her own hotel room? Kevin stammers in confusion. She never mentioned that, Miss Nichols. I'm sorry. Can you confirm to me and to Marvin here, I go on, that you never saw me in the hotel, the night before the murder, or at any other time? You never saw me come in or go out, did you? No, Miss Nichols. I remember everyone who comes into and goes out of the hotel. I would definitely remember if you were here. Did you tell the detective that? I asked. Did you tell him that you never saw me in the hotel that night? Well, he... you see, he never asked. He never asked if I saw you. I'm pretty sure he never asked any of the other staff either. He was more concerned with when I saw Mr. Tripp. I cock my head and frown. Why did he want to know that? Because I was the last person to see him alive. I saw him leave the hotel at nine o'clock, and he didn't come back until after midnight. The detective wanted to know all the details. The whole time he talked to me, he concentrated on that. He never really mentioned you. I furrow my brow. So, Mr. Tripp wasn't even in his room when his wife says I was there? He was out the whole time. Yes, Miss Nichols, I'm certain of it. Did Mrs. Tripp know that? I ask. Did she know the room was empty? I couldn't tell you, Miss Nichols. She never mentioned it. I turn away. Thank you, Kevin. Don't worry about it. I appreciate your help. Marvin walks me to the entrance. Is there anything more I can do for you, Miss Nichols? I really appreciate your help, Marvin, I tell him. You're a lifesaver. Do you think there's any way you could arrange for me to speak to Mrs. Tripp? I don't see why not. She's due to stay here for the next two weeks until after the winter carnival. You can come back to the hotel any time and speak to her. Thank you. I'll do that. 
one more question, please, I ask. He closes his eyes and bows. Anything. Let me make sure I got this straight. Kevin told you someone spotted me in the hotel, and you told Detective Graham. Is that how it went? He nods again. Exactly like that. I see. That explains why he shut me out of the investigation so fast. I open the front door. Thank you, Marvin. I'll let you know when I'm ready to interview Mrs. Tripp. I stride into the parking lot and get into Stacy's car. Did you find what you were looking for? I nod. I found out why David considers me a suspect, and I found my first lead. Good. She starts the motor and turns the car around. That's something, at least. We drive back to West End, but now I've got the case on the brain, and I can't get it off. We've got a live one in Mrs. Tripp. She told the police she was nowhere near West End the night before the murder. She must have been right there inside the hotel if she identified me or whatever strange woman it was coming out of her bedroom. What married woman in their right mind brags about a celebrity sighting instead of worrying about some strange woman rendezvousing with her husband behind her back? Mrs. Tripp saw a woman she thought was me coming out of her hotel room. Instead of confronting her husband with his treacherous ways, she went to the hotel front desk and filled the clerk's ear full of the tale that the famous Margaret Nichols was in the hotel. Even if she knew her husband was out of the room, that's all the more reason her actions make no sense. If she knew her husband wasn't there, and she saw a woman she didn't know coming out of what was supposed to be a locked room, shouldn't she have reported that to the hotel clerk? Not a celebrity sighting. This Mrs. Tripp has some weird stuff going on. Her behavior and her story don't add up, and I intend to find out why. The whole case against me hinges on her seeing me in the room the night before. If I can break that down, I'm all clear. Chapter 9 Stacy drops me off in front of the candy store. I ought to go to Sabrina's and finish my gingerbread houses, but at that moment, I spot David's cruiser parked in front of the used bookstore. He stands by the driver's door, peering at his phone. On an impulse, I trot across the street and walk up to him. He lowers his phone and nods. Good morning. Hey, do you mind if I talk to you for a sec? I ask. He puts his phone in his pocket. Go ahead. I just had a few words with Marvin at the Overlook. You shouldn't have done that, he tells me. You shouldn't be investigating this murder. How could I not investigate it? I return. You can't expect me to just sit back and let you put me away for murder without trying to clear my name. He puffs out his cheeks. For the love of God, Margaret, I am not trying to put you away for murder. What do you call it? I fire back. You suspect me. I call it doing my job, Margaret. Jesus, do you think I enjoy this? Then why don't you work with me to get this case solved instead of trying to sideline me all the time? I ask. You know we could solve it a lot faster working together. He clenches his teeth and shakes his head. I can't. I have to do this by the book. Whatever. I don't. Marvin convinced Kevin to talk to me, too, and he says it was Mrs. Tripp who spotted me coming out of her room. Did you know that? His eyes pierce me to the bone. No, I didn't. I didn't know that. Don't you see what this means? I rush getting the words out. She wasn't in New York at all. For one thing, she saw a woman she didn't know coming out of her own hotel room. Either she knew her husband wasn't in the room, in which case the normal response would have been to alert security and get the woman arrested for breaking and entering, or she didn't know her husband was out, 
in which case the normal response would have been outrage that her husband was cheating on her. Instead, this woman goes to the hotel clerk and blabs that she just saw the great Margaret Nichols, private investigator extraordinaire. Something doesn't add up. He glares at me under heavy brows. What are you saying I should do about it? I hold out both hands, but I can't stop them shaking. I have to convince him while I have his attention. Listen to me. She says she identified me from a picture in the paper. If that's true, she may have made a mistake and gotten me confused with someone else, or rather, gotten someone else confused with me. Marvin agreed to let me interview her, but I think we can use the opportunity to prove she never saw me coming out of her room. If I walked up to her out of the blue, she wouldn't be able to recognize me. That will prove she never saw me coming out of her room in the first place. Then you'll have no reason to suspect me of killing her husband. He rubs his chin. It's an interesting theory, but I'm afraid it's not as simple as that. Whether she identified you correctly or not might have mattered in the early stages of the investigation, but it doesn't matter now. We have other evidence that still casts suspicion on you. What evidence is that? Just then, Ariel comes out of the bookstore with Pauline. Ariel's face lights up. Margaret! Pauline's features change in a heartbeat. She compresses her mouth into a cruel, straight line and shoves Ariel toward the car. David turns away. Thank you for telling me. I'll look into it. I have to go now. Try to stay out of the investigation, okay? Wait a second. I take a step forward. David spins around and blocks my path. Pauline grabs Ariel and pushes her into the back seat of the cruiser. In a second, she slams the door. David moves into my way to stop me. Listen, Margaret, I want you to stay away from Ariel, at least until you clear your name. My heart turns to water, watching the people I care about slip farther and farther away from me. How am I supposed to do that when you won't listen to me? He waves his hand in my face while he backs away toward the car. Just stay away from my daughter. My spirit shatters on the ground at my feet. Please, David, don't do this to me. He gives one last cruel shake of his head and dives into the driver's seat. He starts the cruiser and drives away. Neither he nor Pauline will look at me, but Ariel plasters her face to the rear window. One hand presses against the glass and a look of desperate anguish transforms her normally cheerful face. God, what must this be doing to her? She can't think I'm guilty, surely. I'm certain Pauline thinks I am. But David? How could he seriously think I could kill another human being? Why doesn't he believe me? Why doesn't he believe in me the way he always did before? What could turn him against me so fast? I stumble back to the candy store to find Zack behind the counter. Patty sweeps in the back room. Good news, Mom, Zack chirps. I have a friend who works in the crime lab. His name is Reggie, and I got him to agree to run any tests if you need it. Thanks, sweetheart, I tell him. But I don't have anything to test at the moment. Not yet, he points out. But you will. As soon as you find something, you pass it to me, and I'll pass it to him. That's the way it works. I look up at him and smile in spite of myself. Is that the way it works? Yup, we're a team now. I go about my work, but his comments breathe a little much-needed life into my dreary existence. David might not believe me, but at least someone is still in my corner. Maybe things aren't quite as black as they seem. I still have a few more lifesavers to hold on to in this spinning whirlwind of confusion. I slip back to my office and get lost in paperwork. I still have some use in this world, even if I'm not making much progress on the case. 
After closing time, Zack and I walk home together. The house doesn't offer the same sense of sanctuary, since the forensics people found some smoking gun in here. What did they find? I know they didn't find drugs in my underwear drawer. The instant we get inside, Zack comes up to me with a wicked grin plastered across his face. He rubs his hands together in maniacal glee. So, Mom, what's our first move? I look around me in mock astonishment. I don't know what your first move is going to be, but I'm going to have dinner and then go to bed. Aw, oh, come on, Mom, he chides. You can't give up so easily. Come on, we have a mystery to solve here. What's our first lead to follow up? You're not following up any lead, young man, I tell him. You just finished a ten-hour shift at the store. You need to rest. Oh, piffle, Mom, he exclaims. I'm on the case with you. Now stop all that talk about dinner and come on, I'll drive you. Where are we going? You tell me. Why did we come back home first if we were only going to go out again? I ask. We could have stayed out. We came back to get the car, he tells me. Don't you have to go back to the Overlook Hotel? I stare at him for a moment. He's right. What's stopping me from continuing my own investigation? Nothing, that's what. We hop in the car and burn out to the hotel. It stands in darkness, and I wait in the hall until I see Marvin come in from the dining room. Ah, Miss Nichols, he breezes. Mrs. Tripp is in the parlor. If you wish to speak to her, now would be a perfect time. Thank you again, Marvin. You have my word. I won't create any disturbance for you and your guests. I'm certain of it. He bows himself out. I never met a more polite, considerate host in my life. That guy really knows how to put a person at ease. I make my way to the parlor. There's only one person in it, a tall, spiky-thin woman with her hair sparkle-sprayed into a dazzling helmet around her head, perches in a chair by the fire with her legs crossed. Her sparkle pantyhose match her powder-coated baby blue pumps. She flips the pages of a woman's magazine. She scans each page for a fraction of a second, before she tosses the next page across. The leaves make a scraping noise. Other than that, the crackle of flames makes the only other sound. I step into the room and sit down on a nearby couch where she has no choice but to see me. Her heavily mascaraed eyes slide once toward my face. She doesn't look at me again. I sit still for a minute, trying to decide how to handle this. I can see from her first reaction, she doesn't have a clue who I am. She's never laid eyes on me in my life. After a few minutes, she tosses the magazine on the table with a loud sigh. She flicks her long fingernails against each other in peevish boredom for a second before I take the plunge. Did you hear some guy died in his room on the second floor? She smacks her lipsticked lips. I heard. Can you believe that? I gush. Can you believe he just dropped dead in his hotel room? I just don't know what I would do if I came back to my hotel room and found my husband dead. I mean, how could you keep staying in that same room? I couldn't do it. I would make the management give me another room. She makes a sour face and looks away. She's not the only one who can play this game. If she doesn't recognize me, I can pretend to know nothing about her. Maybe I'll get her to trip into admitting something about the case. She rolls her eyes. So you're married too, huh? Another prisoner on the slave galleon of marriage. We're all going to drown on this sinking yacht, I'm telling you. I widen my eyes at her. Is your marriage really that bad? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring up a painful subject. 
I'm not married. Not anymore. I'm free now. Oh, I frown. I really don't know what she's implying. So you're not married? No, she snaps back. I'm not married. I pretend to brighten up. Well, finding your husband dead in your hotel room would give you a shock, wouldn't it? It's almost as bad as finding a strange woman in your hotel room. I force a laugh to make myself seem stupid and absolutely oblivious to who I'm talking to. Before I get a chance to say anything else, the door opens. Marvin comes into the room. David Graham hovers in the doorway behind him. He scans back and forth between me and Mrs. Tripp. Marvin bends toward Mrs. Tripp. Excuse me, madam. This is the police detective I told you about. He wants to talk to you about the incident in question. She waves her hand at nothing. You might as well. I'm not doing anything in here. David moves into the parlor. I see my chance and get to my feet. I sidle out of the room without a word. David Graham is smart enough to figure out for himself that Mrs. Tripp had no clue she was talking to the great and notorious Margaret Nichols, the private investigator. She never saw me coming out of any hotel room, especially not her own. Marvin stays behind in the parlor with the two of them. I end up in the corridor with no one to see where I'm going or what I'm doing. Now's my chance to snoop around unsupervised. I make my way back to the entrance, only to find the front desk deserted. Even better, I slip upstairs and back to the room where I found the body. A strip of yellow cordon tape covers the closed room door. Police line, do not cross. I've heard that before. I try the doorknob, and it opens. I duck inside and shut the door behind me. Now that I'm in the room, I relax into looking around. What do I hope to find in here? The forensics team already went over everything. I meander through the room, studying every detail, but I make sure not to touch anything. It looks like any normal hotel room, except that no one is staying in it at the moment. All the victim's effects and his wife's personal things are gone. I go into the bathroom and find exactly nothing, not even a fingerprint and toothpaste. What's the point? The forensics team would have found any fingerprints. If they found a fingerprint at the crime scene, David Graham wouldn't be after me right now. I give up and turn back to the door. When I see it, a long, thin table stands against the wall by the room door. I didn't notice it when I first walked in, but I notice it now that I turn to go. I stroll over to it. My pulse pounds when I see a box tray of Christmas candy on the table, labeled Nichols Candy Store. It can't be! How could the victim or his wife buy a box of these sweets from my store without me knowing it? Is that how the wife is claiming she knows what I look like? One of them could have bought it when Zach or Patty was working. I ease over to it, but I hang back like it's some kind of poisonous snake. These candies can't be poison if the victim died of an injection. I peer down into the box. Yes, I know these candies well. Shapes of reindeer and pointy-roofed houses and wrapped presents sit in individual crinkly plastic forms. Another cellophane wrapper twists around each piece to keep them fresh. Each wrapper has a unique number along one edge to identify the lot and batch. With that number, I can track down the package barcode. I can look it up on my inventory database and find out exactly who purchased it from my store. I put out my hand and pluck one of the house candies out of the tray. I slip it into my pocket, still wrapped, and make my escape. Chapter 10 
Zach parks in front of the candy store, and we both go inside to find Patty manning the counter. How are things, Patty? I ask. I'm sorry we left you on your own for so long. It was nothing, she replies. You didn't have to come back here. I can handle a full shift without you guys hanging around. I have a few things to do here anyway, I tell her. I'll be in my office. I grab the inventory book from under the register and take it to my office. When I get there, I settle myself in front of my computer and take out the candy. I unwrap it and type the identification number into my spreadsheet search bar. Zack wanders in. What are you up to, Mom? Hey, sweetie. I found this candy at the crime scene. I'm using the serial number to find out who bought it. He frowns at the wrapper. Nichols Candy Store. That's odd. I would remember some strange tourists buying that candy. That's what I thought, but one of these trays was in the victim's room. That's one of the reasons David thinks I had something to do with it. He thinks I knew either the victim or his wife from before, and that's why I was in the guy's room the night before he died. That's nonsense, he snaps. Anybody could have bought that candy. Anybody could have, but only one person did. Once we find out who bought it, we'll know who killed Mr. Tripp. He leans on my chair arm and watches me work over the computer. I run the number into the spreadsheet and come up with the barcode. Then I cross-reference it with the receipts to bring up the customer name. The receipt blinks onto the screen. I scan up to the name in the corner, and a cold chill runs up my spine. David Graham. Down at the bottom of the page, the receipt lists the credit card information he used to pay for the candy. I frown at the screen. That can't be right. Zack leans in and reads it. That's impossible. There must be some mistake. I'll run it again. I go through the whole process and come up with the same result. I shake the confusion out of my head. There has to be a logical explanation for this. Zack straightens up. He shrugs his shoulders inside his shirt. Ever so slowly, he swings the office door shut before he murmurs low to me. You don't think he had something to do with this, do you? I make a face up at him. Are you telling me Detective David Graham bought this candy and planted at the crime scene to implicate me? I doubt it. How do you explain it, then? I don't want to think about it, especially not when I remember the day he bought the candy. He didn't buy the candy. Ariel bought it. David just paid for it, right before the two of them went for their hike. So how did the candy wind up in the victim's hotel room? This receipt proves one thing. I didn't bring the candy to the victim's room the night before he died. Someone else must have done it. But who? I shut down my computer and put the candy and wrapper in my desk drawer. Whatever this means, I can't follow it up right now. I can't think about it without my world falling apart. I go back out to the counter and start working on my next gingerbread house. Only a few days remain to finish everything for the winter carnival. Patty goes home, and Zack puts on his apron. I'm in the middle of sticking gumdrops to the roof when Sabrina walks in. How many more gingerbread houses are you going to do, Margaret? She asks. I need some walk-in space. I need to know how much more space to leave for you. I'm going to finish this gingerbread house and one more, I tell her. If I'm taking up too much space, let me know and I'll make other arrangements. I'm sure I could put at least two in Stacy's walk-in next door. No, you don't, Sabrina fires back. I have room for them all. I just needed to know so I could plan accordingly. Are you sure you have enough room? I ask. Don't sell your cakes short to make room for my gingerbread houses. Don't you worry about me. I'll manage. 
You just concentrate on getting your gingerbread houses done in time. I laugh and start to come back with a snappy response when the doorbells jangle. All three of us look up as David Graham walks in. Sabrina backs away. I better make myself scarce. You don't have to, I tell her. What can we do for you, detective? As I anticipated, he doesn't take that epithet as a joke. He squares his shoulders at me. I need to talk to you about something, Margaret. It's important. I pick up another gumdrop, smear frosting on the underside, and stick it to the gingerbread roof. If it's that important, you can talk to me about it here. I don't have anything to hide from my son or from Sabrina. He glances at Sabrina. I don't think that's a good idea. Let's go somewhere a little more private. I'm not going anywhere. What could be worse than being accused of a murder I didn't commit? Tell me now. He purses his lips and his eyes flash. Did you take something from the crime scene just now when you were at the Overlook Hotel? My head shoots up. The instant I make eye contact with him, I see the truth written there. He knows all about it. There's no sense lying about it now. Yes, I did. Where is it? He asks. What did you do with it? I didn't destroy it, if that's what you're worried about. It's in my desk drawer. Go get it. His voice gives me no chance to wiggle out of this. I wipe my hands on a rag and go get the candy and wrapper. When I return to the front counter, I find him wearing a pair of latex gloves. He holds open a Ziploc bag to me, and I drop the candy and wrapper into it. He seals the bag and puts it in his pocket before stripping off his gloves. I didn't want to do this out here in front of Zack and Sabrina, but I have to place you under arrest. Sabrina screams. Zack blurts out, What for? For first-degree murder and obstruction of justice. David addresses these awful words to me alone. You don't seem to understand the effort I've made to keep you out of jail. I could have arrested you the other day when we searched your house, but I didn't. You said that before, I pointed out. You still won't tell me what evidence you found to implicate me. We found the syringe that was used to kill Mr. Tripp, he replies. It still had half a barrel full of the belladonna extract, and we found a droplet of his blood in the needle itself. We DNA matched it to the victim. My captain wanted me to arrest you, but I managed to keep you clear based on your reputation around this town. Now I can't do that anymore. You contaminated a crime scene and tampered with evidence. I have no choice but to arrest you. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. He takes hold of my elbow and steers me around the counter. Zack piles in to intervene. Tell him, Mom. Don't let him do this. Tell him what you found. David looks at him. Tell me what? I round on Zack. Don't say a word, Zachary. Not one word. David draws me around the counter to where he stands. He turns my back to him and takes out his handcuffs. Don't do this, Mom! Zack cries. Don't go along with this! Tell him! Tell him right now, or I will! David looks back and forth between the two of us. If you know something about this case, you better tell me now. If I find out you're withholding crucial evidence, it will only go against you later. Tell him, Mom! Zack repeats. I jab my forefinger in his face. Don't you dare say a word! Why won't you tell him? Zack roars. You're trying to protect him. You're sacrificing yourself for him. Why? You don't owe him any allegiance. He's gonna throw you in jail, Mom. For heaven's sake, tell him! David glares at him. You could be in trouble, too, if you withhold evidence. This is my fight. I'll be the one to decide when and who I tell. 
I face David. Let's go. He snaps the cuffs on my wrists. You have the right to have an attorney present during any questioning. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you by the court. He marches me toward the door. I whip around to yell over my shoulder, Call a lawyer, Zack! Sabrina stares after me with enormous eyes. She jolts alert right before I walk through the door. I know a good lawyer, Margaret. I'll call him for you. The next minute, David pushes me out of the candy store to his cruiser parked outside. He guides me to the back door this time. He keeps hold of my elbow while he opens it. Just before he shoves me into the back, I catch sight of Pauline and Ariel across the street. Ariel's mouth twists in all the wrong shapes, watching David put me in the back seat of his car. While I watch, Pauline puts her arms around the girl's shoulders and conducts her to another car in front of the bookstore. I lower my eyes and I lose sight of them inside the squad car. I don't look again. My ears and neck burn when I think about anyone I care about seeing me hauled away in handcuffs. I didn't kill that man. I can't understand how all the evidence points to me, but I have to prove my innocence somehow. Is this the price I have to pay for solving all those murders? To be accused of murder myself? I keep my eyes down while David drives out of town. I might have enjoyed a good reputation in this town before, but that's all gone now. From now on, no one will be able to think of or talk to me without seeing a murderer. People will whisper and point and turn away when I walk down the street. They won't let their children come into the candy store anymore. Not when I'm working, at least. Black despair weighs me down so I don't watch where I'm going until the car stops. David helps me out of the back and leads me into the station. He sits me in the same chair. We just need to finish some booking paperwork. Then I'll fingerprint you and put you in the cell. I don't say anything. The handcuffs are far more uncomfortable than I realized. I can't sit back in the seat or relax with them on. Now I understand how humiliating and dehumanizing it is to get arrested for anything. He types up something on his computer. He asks me a bunch of mundane questions about my vital statistics, but he keeps his face impassive and his voice flat. He finally gets up and leads me to a back room behind the office. An ice-cold hallway leads to a bench against the back wall. Here, he runs my fingertips over an electronic scanner that registers my fingerprints on a computer screen. When he finishes, he presses a button on a remote control. A nearby door pops open. David unlocks the cuffs in the doorway. You'll stay in here for now. I'll check on you in a few hours. Do you see that camera up there? The video feed is monitored 24 hours a day. If you need anything or anything goes wrong, Officer Tomlinson will see and come in a heartbeat. He puts the cuffs in his pocket and motions into a cell. Four bare white concrete walls surround absolutely nothing. The cell contains a single bunk, a toilet, and a sink. Nothing else. At least it's warm in here, though. He waits for me to enter. Then he shuts the door behind me, and the lock clicks into place. I catch a fleeting glimpse of his face through the tiny meshed window before he disappears. I sink onto the bunk. This is the end of the world. No one will believe I'm innocent, and now that I'm in jail... No one else will be able to clear my name either. Why did I tell Zack to keep my findings a secret? Why didn't I tell David what I found out about the candy? Zack was right. I wanted to protect David and Ariel. If an innocent person is going down for Mr. Tripp's murder, it might as well be me. So 
How did the candy get into the victim's hotel room? David couldn't have brought it with him on our date. Why couldn't he have? Was it in the back seat of the car when he drove me to the hotel and I just didn't notice it? Could someone have stolen it out of his car and put it in Mr. and Mrs. Tripp's room? Chapter 11 I lie on the bunk in my jail cell. I cover my eyes with my arm to block out the light, but the environment gives me no peace. I keep obsessing over the case, hour after hour. I must be missing something. Who would kill a hapless tourist? The trips weren't from West End. Maybe they knew one of the other hotel guests from out of town. That makes no sense. Someone put the poison syringe in my house. Why? Why would someone go to all that trouble if they weren't trying to specifically frame me? Whoever killed Mr. Tripp knew not only me, but West End. The killer had to know who I was and where I live. They had to harbor some pretty powerful emotions against me to go to those lengths. I would say they might not even have known Mr. Tripp. They didn't have to. The killer could have selected him at random. The killer might not even have known he was on prescription atropine. Maybe they just used that plant extract. The question is, how and why they entered his room the night of my date with David? What did they hope to accomplish by that? Maybe they knew him after all. Maybe Mr. Tripp was having an affair, and the killer was a jealous husband. So why pin it on me? What did I ever do to the killer to earn their ire? Out of nowhere, the door rattles and opens. David Graham fills the threshold. Someone paid your bail. You're free to go. I sit up on the bunk, but I don't want to believe it. What if it turns out to not be true? Who paid it? He slips his keys into his pocket along with his hand. I'm not supposed to tell you. She wants it to be anonymous, but it was Sabrina Harris. She and Zack are waiting for you outside. I ease to my feet. Now that the door stands open for me to leave like a real live human being, I feel the insidious influence of the jail cell reluctant to release its hold on me. I migrate to where he waits for me. I stand in front of him and look up at his face. He ought to be familiar to me, but he's a stranger now. I don't know how I ever saw him as a friend. I didn't kill him, David. He compresses his lips and lowers his gaze to the floor. Regardless of whatever I may think of you as a person, Margaret, I have a job to do. It's nothing personal. That's easy for you to say, I return. You're being awfully conscientious about doing your job. You have no idea, he growls. I did everything I could to give you the benefit of the doubt. It was your own reckless behavior that put me in a position where I couldn't ignore it any longer. I humph under my breath and barge past him. I don't want to spend another second in here. I make it halfway down the corridor before he calls after me. You found something, didn't you? You found something out about that candy. Help me help you. Tell me what it was. I look over my shoulder at him. If we can never be friends again, I still respect him as a cop. No one can deny his incorruptibility. He cares more than anything to see justice done, even if he is barking up the wrong tree. Okay, David, I'll tell you. I did find out something about that candy. I found out who bought it from my store. He cocks his head to one side. Who? I study him for a long moment. Should I tell him? Should I cast as much suspicion on him as the killer cast on me? I don't want to do that to someone I care about, but he really wants to know. He better know if he and Ariel are in danger. 
I draw myself up. It was you, David. You bought that candy from my store. I don't wait around to see his reaction. I walk out of the station to find Zack and Sabrina waiting for me. Zack throws his arms around me. Oh, thank God you're all right. Was it really awful, Margaret? Sabrina gasps. We got you out as fast as we could, but we had to jump through a bunch of hoops to get you bailed. I return their hugs. Thank you both so much for coming to get me. Let's get out of here. Zack opens the back door to his car. Just as I'm about to get into it, the station door opens. David runs out and calls, Margaret! I peer up at him. His features bear an expression I haven't seen since this case started. His eyes glisten, and his mouth quivers with emotion. Just then, Zack moves between us to block my view of him. He pushes down on my shoulder to guide me into the car. The next thing I know, he and Sabrina slam the doors and we drive away. We leave David standing there. I don't want to think about him on the way back to my house, but the image of his shattered face won't leave me in peace. Is it possible this situation was as hard on him as it was on me? If he cared about me as much as he says he did, he must have found it excruciating to investigate me for murder, not to mention arrest me for it. Now he knows he screwed up. That's got to cut pretty deep, but I can't bring myself to sympathize with him. He put me through the nightmare of my life the last couple of weeks, when he knows perfectly well I'm innocent. Zack drives home. Simone Peretti, Stacy Coons, and Patty Matthews wait for us in the living room. They all rush in to hug me at once. I knew you'd get out eventually, Stacy crows. You just can't keep a strong woman down. What do you want us to do next to clear your name, Margaret? Patty asks. We're going to blow this case wide open. I sink onto the couch. I don't want to blow the case wide open right now. I just want to sit down and relax. Zack brings in a tray of hot cocoa for everyone and places a steaming mug in my hands. You deserve a break, Mom. You've been driving yourself too hard the last few weeks. I finished your gingerbread houses, Sabrina tells me. I didn't know if you would have time, so I just did it. I hope you don't mind. Not at all. Thank you. There must be a trail of clues we can follow to find the killer, Patty continues. Tell us what you found so far. Maybe we can do the investigating for you. Zack and I exchange glances. All right, I tell her. I'm going to tell you what I found, but I don't want anybody rushing off half-cocked without my approval. Why not? Sabrina asks. If the clues lead to the killer, why wouldn't you want the person busted for killing Mr. Tripp? Because the clues lead to Detective Graham, Zack tells her. Mom found a box of candy in the victim's hotel room. It was bought from our candy store on Detective Graham's credit card. Stacy's hand flies to her mouth. That's impossible! He couldn't be a killer! It doesn't lead to Detective Graham, I interject. It leads to Ariel. He bought the candy for her, and the same box wound up in the victim's room. That means one of them was in the victim's room before he died, Simone points out. They couldn't be, Sabrina rejoins. I don't believe either one of them killed that man. They couldn't. For a start, she's a 15-year-old honest student from Hartford. She would have no reason to kill Mr. Tripp. And he's only the most honorable police detective on the force, Stacy adds. I don't care what any of you say. He didn't kill anybody. I don't believe either of them killed the victim either, I tell her. I would rather get charged with murder myself than accuse either of them. 
If neither of them did it, then who did? Simone asks. Who could have left the candy in Mr. Tripp's room and then killed him like that? I was thinking about this when I was in jail, I tell her. David bought the candy for Ariel to take on a hike. Then he took me on a date to the Overlook the night before the victim was killed. If Ariel left the candy on the back seat of his car, say, and someone just happened to snatch it from there as an entree into Mr. Tripp's room, then the killer could be anybody. There doesn't necessarily have to be a connection between the killer and Mr. Tripp, or even the killer and David. It could be sheer coincidence. Don't do this to us, Mom. Zack slaps his forehead and groans. Don't destroy our only lead. If you're right, Sabrina adds, then we're at a dead end. We don't have any way to connect the candy to the killer. That's right, I reply. The others look around at each other. So that's it, Simone asks. We're finished. Is this really the end of the line? I haul myself to my feet. Listen to me, all of you. I really appreciate your support and your offers of help, but right now I just need to settle into my own house and recover from spending the night in jail. I'll think about the case some more and see what I can come up with. If I need any help investigating this case, you'll be the first to know. Right now, though, I just need to putter around my house and weed my garden without thinking about much of anything. I go around the room and hug one person after another. They resist leaving, but I herd them to the door, promising to inform them as soon as I find any lead to chase. One by one, they depart to their own lives and businesses. Each one promises some nugget to help me out, but I listen with only half an ear. I want to be alone right now and the case is the last thing in the world I want to think about. Sabrina leaves last. After she hugs me, she pats me on the shoulder. I'll handle the rest of the prep for the carnival, Margaret. You don't have to worry about a thing. I want to help out with the carnival, Sabrina, I tell her. I'll be back at work tomorrow and we'll finish our display. That will be the perfect distraction for me to get back on my horse. She turns away. You know where I'll be. You come and find me when you're ready to do it. Until then, I'll keep working on the display so we make a good showing at the carnival. We won't let this dampen our plans. Thank you for everything. I put my arms around her. It's a relief to know I have so many people in this town pulling for me. She heads back to town. I shut my front door to find Zack standing next to me. Are you sure you're going to be okay, Mom? I'm worried about you. Why are you worried about me? I ask. I'm just fine. Never better. It's all this stuff about Detective Graham. I'm worried that you're putting his interests ahead of your own. You're taking the fall to protect him from suspicion. It's like Stacy said, I tell him. I don't believe he had anything to do with Mr. Tripp's death, and as far as me protecting him from suspicion, I'm not doing that. I told him just before I left the station. He knows the candy came from him. He knows everything I know now. He blinks at me. He does? Yes, he does. He knows enough to follow the trail of breadcrumbs as well as I can. Now, can we please drop it? I don't want to talk about the case anymore. I walk away from him. I go to the bathroom. I mess around in the kitchen for a while. Then I go out to the garden. I get busy cleaning up the dead leaves and plants rotting in my flower beds. I haven't spent nearly enough time gardening lately. I let myself get pulled away by so many other distractions. I go to the shed and get out my pruners. I slip into my galoshes and gardening gloves. 
I put on my coat and scarf and go through the gate to the front yard. I wave to Kyle Davidson and Jonah across the street, and Kyle waves back before they go inside. A brisk wind whips down the street and shakes the bare tree branches. I get lost in the peaceful quiet of working outside. Even the harsh New England cold offers its soothing tranquility. I don't have to think about the case. I can just enjoy the elements and the soothing now of pruning my rose bushes. I don't know when I'll get another chance to appreciate this. I clip the long stems off and pile them near the sidewalk. I'm already planning on going to the backyard to get my leaf tarp to carry the branches to the green waste. I crouch down to rake the dead leaves away from the bush stem when something hard lands against the back of my skull. A splitting pain explodes through my brain and a horrible pit of nausea stabs into my guts. I try to stand up, but my head spins in agony. I blink the stars out of my eyes, but blackness descends over me and wipes out all awareness. I topple over on my side and fall into unconsciousness. Chapter 12 I wake up in darkness. A shaft of soft gray light streams into a dingy basement from a window high above my head. I wince in pain when I try to sit up. My head aches and I can't move my arms. It takes me a minute to put the events together into a coherent sequence. I was working in my garden. Now I'm sitting on a filthy basement floor with my hands tied behind my back and a gag in my mouth. I wriggle against my bonds, but they hold me tight. Even the gag is tied in place too tightly to budget. Where am I? Who kidnapped me this time? The basement gives nothing away. I've never seen it before in my life. Dust-covered shelves of old bottles and random empty crates line the walls. The only window sits high up one wall, too high for me to reach, even if I could get to my feet. I kick one of the shelves in annoyed spite. How am I going to get out of here? For all I know, I'm too far away from anything to get to safety, even if I could escape. All at once, I hear voices above my head. I know, sweetie but I don't think it's a good idea at this time of year. But I have to go! I freeze when I recognize Ariel's youthful cry. It's the most important event of the season, and everyone is working hard to prepare. Why can't I go? I already explained this to you, darling. It's a woman answering. I don't want you spending a winter's night on the beach in all kinds of weather. No social occasion is worth your health. Do you want to wind up in the hospital? David says it's okay, Ariel grumbles, and he's my father. My mind whizzes. I must be in Pauline and Ariel's house in Hartford. That's the only explanation and I know Ariel didn't knock me over the head and tie me up in the basement. The clues slot into place one after the other. Pauline! If Ariel didn't leave the candy in David's car for someone to pinch, then she must have brought the box home with her. That gives Pauline opportunity to do something with it. If she... How else would the candy have gotten into the victim's hotel room? So why did she kidnap me? I barely know the woman. Her voice comes all mixed up with footsteps on the ceiling above my head. They must be in the room directly over me. I know he's your father, Ariel, but I'm still your mother and your legal guardian. Why do you think he hasn't tried to get full custody of you yet? 
He knows I'm doing a good job of raising you. Maybe even a better job than he could do. He's a single man living alone. He's not alone. He has Margaret. In desperation, I fling out my foot to kick the shelf again. If I can only attract someone's attention, maybe someone will come and help me. I lay into the shelf support again and again. I have to make some noise. I have to alert Ariel that I'm here. Quick drumming footsteps pound the floor overhead. The next minute, a deep bass voice joins the conversation. I know it's short notice, but I need to talk to you about something. It's important. My heart leaps when I recognize David's voice. I freeze to listen. Please, God, let him hear me. Let him realize how that candy got from Ariel's possession into the victim's hotel room. I'm glad you're here, Colleen replies. I was just explaining to Ariel that I don't think it's a very good idea for her to go to the Winter Carnival. We can discuss that later, David booms. I have something more important to talk to you about. Oh, what is it? Colleen asks. Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, I pray. The candy I bought for Ariel before we went on that hike, David replies. I gave it to her, and she had it with her when I dropped her off here that night. So, Pauline asks. So, the box wound up at the Overlook Hotel, David goes on. It turned up in the room of a man who was murdered. The serial number on the candy wrappers traces back to my credit card. It was the same candy. I don't understand what you're implying. Pauline's voice goes tight and strained. That doesn't prove anything. It proves, David booms through the floorboards, that either you or Ariel was in the victim's hotel room before he died. How do you explain that? I don't know what you're talking about, Pauline snaps. This is ridiculous. I don't have to listen to this. My heart leaps. He knows. He's on to her. I fly into action harder than ever. I have to alert him where I am. I have to get his attention somehow. I flip over on my side and lock both my ankles around the nearest shelf. I wrench at it with all my might. Tugging at it hurts my shoulder digging into the concrete floor, but I don't give up. I shake the shelf back and forth until one of the decrepit wooden crates slides off. I hear David and Pauline arguing upstairs, but I can't make out the words. None of that matters now. Only the crate matters. I watch in breathless anticipation as it creeps close to the edge of the shelf. All at once, it topples over the side and smashes to the floor with a splintering crash. I suck in my breath. Please, God, let David hear me. Silence reigns upstairs. Then, David's voice echoes through the floor again. What was that? It was nothing, Pauline clips. It must be mice. It didn't sound like mice, David rumbles. It sounded like something in your basement. In desperation, I try yelling. I scream and bellow for David, but the gag muffles all sound. While you're here, Pauline continues, I'd like to get this winter carnival business figured out so Ariel has a firm answer. I don't want to continue justifying myself to her when you're telling her one thing and I'm telling her something else. I'm not talking about the winter carnival, David thunders back. If you don't explain how and why you took that candy to the Overlook, I'll have no choice but to consider you a suspect in the murder. That's nonsense, Pauline snaps. I never killed anybody. Where were you the afternoon of December 14th between 2 and 5 p.m.? He asks. 
Holy smokes, he's checking her alibi. He really thinks she's guilty. I have to get out of here. I have to make some sound. That's all there is to it. I can't let him walk out of this house without finding me. If he does, Pauline will stop at nothing to get rid of me. I leap into a panic and attack the shelf harder than ever. I smash the supports and bend all my muscle power to pulling the shelf over. I don't hear the rest of their conversation. I'm too intent on making as much noise as I can. The shelf rocks. The old wood buckles and parts of it tear loose from the wall. Bottles roll off and crash onto the floor. I close my eyes against the shards, but I don't give up on that shelf. I'll tear the whole house down before I give up. Voices rise upstairs, but I can't understand the words. I pull back one foot and kick the shelf with all I have. It wobbles one more inch, and the anchor bolt holding it to the wall rips free. The shelf lists forward. More crates and bottles rain around my head. I cower as best as I can, but I can't protect my head. I give one more almighty kick, and the shelf leans all the way forward. It tilts and falls flat on its face next to me. The basement trembles with breaking wood and glass. I cough dust out of my throat and almost gag on the fabric in my mouth. I can't see anything around me through the fog when two hands come to rest on my cheeks. Margaret, David calls. Margaret, are you okay? He pulls the gag free and pets my hair back from my face. I'm... I'm okay, I stammer. Get me out of here! He gets busy on the ropes holding my arms. When he frees me, he helps me to my feet. Thank goodness you're all right. I can't believe he's here. My heart pounds in relief that I'm safe at last. David dives forward and kisses me, and I laugh in heartfelt happiness. Everything's okay now. Just then, his phone pings. He glances at the screen and smirks. What is it? I ask. It's Kyle Davidson. He says he saw someone hanging around your garden earlier, and he thinks he saw them putting something in the trunk of their car. He must have seen Pauline taking you away. The phone plings again. Now what? He chuckles. It's Zack telling me you're missing. He taps the screen. I'm telling him I found you. Before I can say anything, the unmistakable sound of a car engine starting upstairs vibrates through the floor into the basement. David takes my hand. I think we have a killer to catch. Come on. He leads me up the stairs into a very nice, immaculately white kitchen. He conducts me through a fancy house to the front door. Outside, he positions us in the driveway. The car motor comes from inside the garage. David holds my hand, and we barricade off the driveway. What are you going to do? I whisper. At that moment, the garage door purrs open. A large white Cadillac occupies the space inside the garage. Steam billows around it when the door opens. I catch just a faint outline of a woman behind the wheel. David lets go of my hand and draws his sidearm. Turn the car off, Pauline. It's over. You're not going anywhere. She doesn't move in the driver's seat. David raises his gun and aims it at the windshield. Is he really going to shoot her? I still can't bring myself to accept that she killed Mr. Tripp and kidnapped me. Why would she do something like that? Turn the car off, David roars. You are under arrest for murder, kidnapping, and attempted murder. Don't make it more difficult on yourself than it needs to be. Think of Ariel. Don't do this to her. Pauline doesn't budge. I can't see her features through the steamy windshield. 
but I don't like facing down a running vehicle. All she has to do is hit the gas, and she could flatten both of us without even trying. Then she can drive off into the sunset. I only hope she doesn't have Ariel in the car, but I can't see the girl from here. David brings up his other hand. He takes hold of his gun with both hands and locks his elbows at Pauline. He doesn't warn her again. The two of them confront each other in a standoff out of some bad movie. I want to run and hide. I almost wish I was still in the basement where I would be safe. All at once, with no warning, Pauline hits the gas hard. The car screeches out of the garage, heading straight for us. I dive out of the way to save myself, but David doesn't move. He takes aim and fires into the engine block. Four bullets thump against the hood. The car makes it halfway down the driveway when something pops inside it. A cloud of steam hisses through the grill and the motor dies. David steps out of the way, and the car rolls to a halt right in front of him. Through the passenger window, I catch sight of Pauline pounding the steering wheel with her fists. Her mouth moves in silent, furious curses. David regards her through the driver's window. The car stops, and he taps his gun against the glass. Pauline thumps both hands against the wheel and sits still. She stares straight in front of her until David opens the door. Get out of the car, Pauline, he tells her. It's all over. You're not going anywhere except to jail. He takes hold of her arm, but she yanks it free. Don't you dare touch me! He tightens his grip and wrestles her out of the car. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You can't do this to me! She shrieks as he turns her around and shoves her down on the hood. I'll pay you back for this, Margaret! Don't think you can get away with this! I gasp out loud. Me? What did I ever do to you? You got in my way! She snarls. You think you're so innocent and good and helpful. You're nothing but a speed bump in my way. I'll get rid of you one of these days, and then you'll never be able to interfere in my happiness again. A speed bump? I exclaim. I never wanted to interfere in your happiness, Pauline. You have everything in the world you could want. You have a beautiful home and a lovely daughter and a husband who loves you. What more could you want? She jerks her head away, but that's as much as she can do with her hands cuffed behind her back. She shuts her mouth and refuses to answer me. To my surprise, David answers my question. She wanted me. Isn't that right, Pauline? Isn't that the one thing you wanted that you couldn't get? I stare at Pauline. The agonized expression on her face confirms it. She was jealous of me. She framed me to get me out of the way so she could get unfettered access to David. He pulls her off the car and marches her to his cruiser, where he puts her in the back seat. He slams the door and turns to face me. I'm sorry it took me so long to pull my head out of the clouds. You got there eventually, I tell him. How did you know she was after you? He cracks a broad grin. I've known for a long time. A guy doesn't have to be a detective to know when a woman is interested in him. You never told me, I remark. You kept it a secret all this time. You were jealous enough as it was, without knowing you might actually have been right. Besides, I didn't want anything to get in the way of spending time with Ariel. But she's married, I point out. How could she turn her back on her husband? She hasn't loved him in years. She told me so. When the three of us hung out together, she found a new sense in living. I could see it in her eyes. 
She wanted the three of us to be a family, and the only way she could do that would be to get you out of the picture. I shake my head and take another look around. The enormous white house towers over the neighborhood. When I glance up, I see Ariel peeking out of the upstairs window. What are you going to do about her? I have to take Pauline to the station. Will you stay with Ariel for a little while? When I finish, I'll come and pick you both up and take you home. I cock my head. Home? You mean... Home to West End. Ariel's my daughter. She'll come and live with me now. All right. I'll take care of her until you come back. He squeezes my elbow. Thank you. I start to turn away, but he holds me back. Margaret? Yeah? I mean, thank you. I mean, really, thank you. Thank you for trying to protect me and Ariel. Of course, I reply. You know I would never let anything happen to you two. You let yourself get arrested for murder rather than expose me to any suspicion, he points out. I can never thank you enough for that. I shrug his compliments away. Never mind. We both have a job to do, and right now, Ariel needs us both. Go take Pauline to the station, and I'll be waiting here for you when you come back. He doesn't leave. He draws close to me and puts his arms around me. I never want to lose you. He kisses me, and I wilt into his embrace. I never want this to end either. I never want him to look at me as a suspect again, but it's nice to know that, if he does, I can trust him to uphold the truth, no matter how unpleasant it turns out to be. I get lost in the magical warmth of his arms and his lips. I don't want to let him go, but all too soon, he backs away toward his car. He gets in and drives away with Pauline. So I was right to guard myself against her. I didn't imagine it. She really was trying to come between me and David. Maybe I should listen to my instincts more often. Chapter 13 After the cruiser vanishes around the corner, I turn to Pauline's house. Now I face a much bigger challenge. I go inside and climb the stairs. I hunt around until I find Ariel's bedroom. She sits on the bed working on an iPad. She looks up when I enter. Is she gone? I nod and sit down on the bed next to her. David is taking her to the police station. She's under arrest for killing that man at the Overlook Hotel. The man you were accused of killing? I nod down at my hands in my lap. She tried to frame me. She injected him with poison and hid the syringe in my house. She wanted to get rid of me so she and David could be together with you. She gazes out the window. I'm glad she's gone. I'm glad I won't have to live with her anymore. Don't be glad about that, I tell her. She did a good job of raising you. She worked hard for a long time to take care of you before David came back into your life. Ariel shakes her head. She's the one who is poison. She's been poison in all our lives for a long time. She was a good mother on the outside, but inside she was rotten. I don't say anything about that. She knows Pauline better than anyone. I guess that's why Ariel wanted to live with David in the first place. Well, you probably won't see her again for a very long time. In a little while, David will come and take you home to his house. You'll probably live with him until you leave for college. She brightens up. That's what I want! I guess there is one good thing about it, I remark. You'll be able to go to the Winter Carnival after all. 
She breaks into a brilliant grin. I'll be able to see you all the time, Margaret. That's another good thing. Yeah. I clasp her hand. You will. You know, Margaret, Ariel tells me, you're really good. I can see that as well as anybody else. Mom is poison, but you're good. You're nothing like her. I hope not, I reply. I try to do good for people, and I would never hurt someone to try to get their man away from them. Her face falls. What about my dad? What's going to happen to him now that Mom is gone? Are you worried he will try to keep you away from David? I ask. Are you worried he'll stop David from getting custody of you? Oh, no, Ariel exclaims. He wants David to take me back. He feels the way I do, that I belong with David, and the whole adoption was a colossal mistake. I have to smile while I press her hand. It wasn't a mistake. Not even David thinks that. You might be right, but I still want to be with David. He's my father, my real father. I don't want to waste any more time. Well, you won't. Now show me what you're working on. I scoot in next to her on the bed. She makes space for me, but she doesn't show me her iPad. You know, Margaret, my mom said you were no good for David. Really? Why did she say that? She said you dragged him down. She said you weren't a good influence on him, or... or on me. I snort with laughter. That's rich coming from her, don't you think? I never listened to her. I want you to know that. I never thought you were a bad influence. I hug my arm around her shoulders. That's okay, sweetie. I don't hold what Pauline said against you. She made a lot of bad choices. None of that has anything to do with you. She sinks back into her beanbag. Thanks. Did you think I would? I ask. Did you think she could poison our relationship the way she tried to mess up my relationship with David? She shrugs and looks down at her knuckles. I wasn't sure. I thought maybe, you know. No, I don't know. What did you think? She shakes her hair out of her eyes to look at me. I thought you wouldn't trust me when you found out the things she said to me about you. I thought you would keep your distance. I won't do that. I give her another hug. You're a separate person from her. What she said and what she thinks isn't you. You don't agree with her, do you? No, of course not. There you go. We're all good, as they say. She brings up her iPad and starts showing me her studies. We sit there for over two hours. She leaves my head spinning, explaining some of her advanced placement physics problems. David appears in the door. Are you two ready to go home? Ariel jumps to her feet. Yes! I rub my head. Saved by the bell. David laughs. Don't worry, there will not be a test at the end of the hour. That's good, because I would fail. Pack yourself an overnight bag, Ariel, he tells her. You don't need to bring everything. I'll arrange with your dad to pick up the rest of your things another day. Ariel flies into a whirlwind of activity, packing her school uniforms and computers and toiletries. The job takes another hour. I should have thought to get her to do that before we started with the academics. At last, we load her suitcase into David's cruiser. She gets into the back, and I get into the front. None of us mentions Pauline on the way back to West End. David drives me to my house, and we get out on the sidewalk. I hope you don't mind if I don't stick around he tells me. I have to take Ariel to my house and get a room all set up for her. Don't you already have that? 
I ask. She always stayed in my guest room before. Now I have to clear all the guest stuff out of it so she can start making it her real own room. I can't stop smiling at him. I'm happy for you. You finally got your daughter back. I should be happy, but I'm not. I owe you an apology, Margaret. You owe me an apology for saving my life? I snort. I don't think so. I never would have suspected Pauline if you hadn't found out about that candy. You solved this case, as usual. I was just on hand to arrest the suspect. I take his hand. Man, it feels good to touch him like this after all this time. It's all right. We did it together, and now the killer is behind bars. He slips one arm around me. I don't think she'll mind if I kiss you. I doubt it. I bend back my head, and our lips meet. I hug him around the middle. He never felt so good. He pulls away. I'll see you later, okay? Okay. Let me know if either of you need anything. You'll be the first person I call. He waves to me, getting into his car. He and Ariel both wave until they disappear down the street. I stand on the sidewalk and stare into the distance for a long time. I never expected this case to end so abruptly. Now it's over, and Pauline is behind bars. Ariel is going home to David's house. I shouldn't be happy that a man is dead and a woman is on her way to prison, but maybe Ariel is right. Maybe this is the universe's little way of correcting the mistake that happened when David's wife died. Maybe this is the completion of a long, circuitous mystery. Now Ariel is coming back to the place where she should have grown up all those years ago. I wonder how Pauline's husband is taking all this. I know David Graham well enough to know he would never cut Ariel's adoptive father out of her life, but maybe he and Ariel know best. She really does belong with David. She never really belonged with Pauline and her husband in the first place. I turn toward my porch. Zack rushes out to meet me. Are you okay, Mom? Where have you been? I hold up my hand and push past him into the house. I sink down on the couch, more drained than I was when I got out of jail. Zack flutters around me, firing questions a mile a minute. Just give me a second, sweetie, I tell him. I've been worried sick ever since I got the detective's text. I smile up at him. Do you mean the one that said he found me and I was fine? Is that the text you mean? One minute you were working out in the garden. The next minute you were gone. I thought something awful happened to you. I pat his arm. It did, but everything's okay now. I found out who killed Mr. Tripp, and the killer is behind bars. He blinks at me with his mouth open. What happened? I sigh and collapse back on the couch. I might as well tell you, you're going to find out pretty soon anyway. It was Pauline Dunroy. She tried to kill me so she could get David to herself, and she framed me for Mr. Tripp's murder. But it's all over now. She's in jail, and Ariel is going home to David's house as we speak. He stares at me for a minute. Then he throws himself down on the couch next to me. Man, Mom, do you have to go getting into so much trouble all the time? I don't try to. It just sort of happens to me. But I'm going to try to avoid it in the future. Anyway, I'm home now, and we don't have to worry about the murder or me being accused of it. I'm clear, and the case is over. Chapter 14 
I stand behind my display table in front of the candy store. Or should I say, we stand behind our display table in front of the candy store. Sabrina's three colossal cakes and my gargantuan gingerbread houses occupy most of the table space. They leave just enough room for her baked goods and my sweets, both homemade and store-bought. We barely have time to talk between the never-ending stream of tourists plying their way through town. They stop off at every table to sample the wares, chat to the locals, and move on. Everybody wears heavy coats, scarves, and gloves against the cold. The clouds hang heavy overhead. No hint of sunshine comes through, and the cold bites my fingers and toes, even through my many layers. Dozens of stalls, booths, and display tables line Main Street. Almost everyone in town works behind one of them, but I can't see anyone I know between the many heads crowding around. Half the people want to taste Sabrina's cakes. Most of the kids want to steal candy off the gingerbread houses. I have to shove more sweets in their hands to distract them. Zack and Patty mill around near the entrance to our display tent, handing out more candy to anyone that wants it. All at once, a great uproar sounds in the distance. I jump up to see what it's all about and see a car easing onto Main Street. It pulls a sleigh on wheels with Santa Claus seated in the back, surrounded by presents. All the kids rush away in a hurry. They clamber around the sleigh, all shouting at once. Santa waves and shouts, Merry Christmas! Who is it? I ask Sabrina. I don't recognize him. Maybe it's Detective Graham. I think he would have told me if he planned to dress up as Santa Claus, I remark. I'm right here. David comes out of the crowd with Ariel. He meanders to my side and kisses me. Who's Santa? I ask. I don't recognize him. I think it might be Marvin, he replies. It is kind of hard to tell. Even looking closely at Santa, I can't see any distinguishing features under his beard and bushy white eyebrows. If it is Marvin, he certainly has me fooled. Ariel looks up at David. Can I go see? Go on, he tells her. Just watch out for that car. Don't get your feet run over. She scampers into the crowd to join the kids flocking around Santa's sleigh. From here, I can see her cheeks glowing with pleasure. It's great to see her enjoying Christmas, even if she is 15. She hasn't lost her holiday spirit, and her mother getting arrested doesn't seem to have dampened her enthusiasm either. David eases up to me behind the table and murmurs into my ear. I thought you'd like to know Pauline pled guilty to first-degree homicide and kidnapping. She received 40 years without the possibility of parole. I put my arms around him and let my head fall on his chest. Thank God! He kisses the top of my head. I thought you would be pleased to hear that. She had to confess in front of the court. What did she say about how she did it? She said she disguised herself as you and took the candy as a lure to try to get Mr. Tripp to let her into the room. When she found him gone, she picked the lock and went in anyway. Mrs. Tripp caught her coming out, and she told Mrs. Tripp she was you to deflect suspicion. Apparently, Mrs. Tripp was so blown away by meeting the famous Margaret Nichols that she didn't notice the famous Margaret Nichols was in her hotel room without permission. That's when Mrs. Tripp went and told Kevin that she saw you. Did she say anything about the kidnapping? I ask. He shifts from one foot to the other and peers out at the ocean. I wasn't going to tell you this but she says she was going to kill you. When you posted bail, she thought you would be acquitted of the murder. She decided to take matters into her own hands. She knocked you out and took you to her basement, 
when Ariel came home. She planned to smooth things over with Ariel and go back to the basement, but it didn't work out that way. There's one thing I can't figure out. Maybe you can enlighten me. What is it? He asks. Why did Mrs. Tripp claim she was out of town when she wasn't? She must have known she would get caught. She was seeing someone on the side. She came up with a big story about how she went to New York when she never left West End. She got so wrapped up in that story that she forgot all about the fact that she told Kevin about her celebrity sighting. I observe the kids screaming and shrieking in glee. Santa's sleigh comes to a stop in front of the enormous Christmas tree set up by the vacant lot. Santa starts handing out presents to all the kids. I don't think I like all this talk about me being a celebrity, I remark. I wouldn't have been accused of murder if Mrs. Tripp didn't think I was some great and magnificent detective. You got accused of murder because Pauline made sure you got accused of it, he points out. You're not a killer. Everyone who knows you knows you're not one. Still, I counter, I don't want to go through that again. You won't, because Pauline won't be around to try to steal you away from me. What about you? I look up at him. Did you know all along that I wasn't a killer? You shouldn't even have to ask that, he replies. You know I never lost faith in you. I'm a cop. I had to treat the case as one, in spite of my personal feelings for you. I know. I close my eyes on his chest again. It sure does feel good to put it behind me, though. We watch the crowd for a while. I cast a sidelong glance up at him, and he catches me looking. What? You never told me where in my house you found the syringe with the belladonna extract in it, I tell him. You never asked. Do you really want to know? I'm not sure I do want to know, I reply. I'm worried you're going to tell me you found it in my underwear drawer or something. A mysterious smile tugs the corners of his mouth. Would it be so bad if I looked in your underwear drawer? Yes, it would. I would be mortified. I don't think I could date you anymore. He brays with laughter. In that case, I definitely will not tell you where we found it. I swat his shoulder. You better tell me. Did you look in my underwear drawer or not? No, I didn't. He lays his hand against his jacket lapel and closes his eyes. You have my word as a Boy Scout that I have never seen inside your underwear drawer. Sibley from the forensics team was the one who searched that part of the house, and anyway, we didn't find the syringe in your underwear drawer or anywhere else in your bedroom. Does that satisfy you? Where did you find it? I ask. I thought you didn't want to know, he points out. Make up your mind. I'm going to tickle you until you tell me. I dig my fingertips into his ribs until he howls. Tell me right now. Fine. He fights me off until I quit. They found it under the sink in your laundry room. It's a standard hiding place and probably the most obvious place to look. Pauline wasn't very creative. Then again, she wasn't really trying to hide the syringe. She wanted to put it somewhere it would be found easily. I nod and turn away. Thank you. I'm relieved. So am I, he murmurs. I was worried this was going to be an ongoing issue between us. I have to laugh. Maybe you should come over and take a look at my underwear drawer, just to get it over with, so neither of us has to worry about it hanging over our heads. Nope. He smacks his hands against his thighs. I will never look in your underwear drawer. It will remain strictly off limits to me for the rest of my life, so we can all live in peace without having to worry about the consequences. We both laugh and the subject evaporates into nothing. 
Ariel comes streaking past with a bunch of other kids. Her hair whips across her face, and her cheeks glow with pleasure. She clutches her present amid shouts and cries back and forth along the street. Your daughter certainly seems to be settling into her new life, I point out. She loves it here, he tells me. She's settling better than I am. I keep expecting the roof to cave in, but it doesn't. She's perfectly happy living with me. I never thought the transition would go so smoothly. I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. I don't think you have anything to worry about, I tell him. She wanted to come live with you. What are you saying? He asks. Are you saying I should just get used to this as the new status quo? Isn't that what you want? I return. You wanted your daughter. Now you have her. Yeah, but... He falters. What if she changes her mind? I don't think that's likely to happen. She has two more years left of school. Then she'll go to college. Just enjoy your time with her while it lasts. She wants to make up for the years she didn't get to grow up with you. You should do the same. He gazes at her, playing up and down Main Street, and a wistful tear comes into his eye. Yeah, you're right. I slip my arm around his waist one more time. You're going to make a good dad for her. You deserve this. He kisses me again, but he doesn't say anything. I watch his face twist with buried emotion. He's finding out what it means to be a parent, the good and the bad, the responsibility and the sadness when you realize it can never last. I turn my attention to Zack. He chats to Gilly while he holds out samples and pamphlets in front of the display table. I'm glad I have him in my life right now, but it can never last. The best case scenario is that he'll find someone who makes him happy and move out on his own. I got lucky that he didn't go away to college right after high school. It's only a matter of time before something else takes him away. Just then, another ruckus breaks out over by the Christmas tree. Stacy and Simone appear out of the crowd, and Stacy climbs up on Santa's sleigh. Thank you all for coming out to our winter carnival and making it even bigger and better than last year. We will now light the Christmas lights on our tree to officially open the carnival, and I hope you'll all join us on Christmas Eve for our annual bonfire on the beach. She jumps down and takes hold of the lever hooked up to wires leading to the tree. She hesitates and shouts break out all over again. Do it, someone calls. Light it, someone else yells. All at once, she throws the lever. The tree explodes into light all the way to the golden star hanging level with the nearest roof. At the same moment, garlands strung across the street light up too. Strings of bright lights burst alive all over town. The crowd erupts in cheers. West End glows from one end to the other. It looks more Christmassy than I ever thought it could. The lights dispel the gray weather and send a warming glow into my heart. This is what Christmas should be like. Over by the electrical lever, Stacy and Simone put their arms around each other. Side by side, they admire their handiwork. They accomplished this moment by working together. They agreed to put the tree somewhere neither of them wanted, and putting it by the vacant lot means they could reach more of the town with additional strings of lights and decorations. Just then, a hush falls over the town. Everyone sucks in their breath and looks around with wide eyes as a few feathery snowflakes drift across Main Street. They hang suspended in front of our faces and float on the breeze. 
I glance first at David and then at Sabrina. All the kids look at each other, questioning if this is real. The next minute, a heavy curtain of snowflakes descends over West End. The flakes reflect the lights and make the town sparkle. In an instant, everyone starts laughing and talking, but the atmosphere around town changes. A peaceful air of comfort and warmth fills Main Street. People smile more, if that's possible. It really feels like Christmas. Kids catch snowflakes on their tongues and stare at the geometric shapes on their sleeves and gloves. The adults talk in quieter voices. A gentle feeling of togetherness enfolds everyone. Just as many people come through our tent as before, but without the rush of urgency. The snow covers the tree and the garlands between the buildings. It lays a blanket of white over West End and makes everything beautiful and right. Chapter 15 Zack positions his hammer over the nail and taps it into place. Don't smash your thumb, I warn. He bites his lip, embedding the nail into my mantelpiece. He hangs his stocking on the end and taps in another nail for Gilly's stocking. He turns around and holds out his hand. Where's yours, Mom? I wave at him. I'm not putting up a stocking. Yes, you are, he fires back. It's Christmas Eve. You have to. I told you she was a Grinch, David adds. I am not a Grinch, I counter. I just don't want to hang up a stocking. That's for kids, not elderly ladies who run their own businesses. First of all, David replies, you're not elderly. You're younger than I am. Are you telling me you're hanging up a stocking at home? I ask. You bet I am. I hung it up before we came over here. You should see it, Ariel interjects. It's an old gray sock with holes in the heel. It is not, he exclaims. Don't go telling lies about me. For another thing, Zack chimes in. You're not a lady either. Watch it, boy, I snarl. I can still wash your mouth out with soap. Everybody laughs. Go on, Margaret, Ariel encourages me. It's Christmas Eve. You have to hang up a stocking. Well, who's going to fill it? I ask. The parents are supposed to fill the kids' stockings. Sacrilege, Zack hisses. Santa Claus fills all the stockings, including the stockings of elderly ladies who run their own businesses and aging police detectives who don't know how to darn their socks. Now go upstairs and don't come down until you have a stocking to hang up. I dutifully go upstairs and select a chunky knitted sock in bright colors. When I come down, Zack drives in another nail and hangs it up for me. Then he turns to Sabrina. What about you, Sabrina? You don't have anyone to spend Christmas with, so you better hang up your stocking here. She looks around the room in stunned surprise. I didn't bring a stocking. I didn't know I was expected to hang it here. Well, you might as well do it here, Ariel replies. Then Santa won't have to make an extra stop at your house. He can just fill it here. You're spending the night so you can share Christmas dinner with us tomorrow, I add. You might as well do the stocking thing here, too. I don't have a stocking, she points out. I go back upstairs and come down with a different sock. We hang it up next to mine. Is that all? Zack counts up the people present. I guess that's it. Let's go. We all troop to the entry and climb into our coats and hats and scarves. Then we bustle out of the house into the snowy dark. Laughter and conversation accompany us to our cars. 
I get into David's car with him and Ariel. Zack, Gilly, and Sabrina get into Zack's car, and we convoy to the beach. When we get out in the parking lot, the sky clears into a brilliant spectacle of stars glowing in the Milky Way. David switches on a flashlight. Lights bob all over the place as more cars pull in and people get out. They swarm onto the beach. The surf churns out of sight in the distance, and a brisk winter wind blows off the waves. I can't see the water. I can only see a carpet of waving lights pouring onto the beach. David takes my hand, and we join the throng. Sabrina appears at my side. We couldn't ask for better weather for the bonfire at the beach. That's the truth, I reply. It's a perfect night. It looks like we'll have a good turnout, too, she points out. I was worried the beach would be deserted and we would be out here all alone. Out of the gloom, the strains of singing voices fill the night. A group of carolers strolls up the beach. They carry candles in one hand and their notebooks in the other. They sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. The notes fill my heart to overflowing. This is the most perfect Christmas ever. All the flashlights converge on one spot. David guides us in that direction. Stacy emerges from the shadows, calling everyone together. Come on, everybody! The bonfire is about to start! Kids gather around her. Tourists flock up the beach in droves, all collecting around a massive pile of firewood arranged on the beach. The Overlook Hotel stands statuesque on its pinnacle and watches everything through its window eyes. Golden light streams out and gets lost in the endless black over the ocean. When everyone forms a crowd around the bonfire, Officer Tomlinson takes a long-handled lighter from his pocket and strikes a flame. It spreads through the wood until flames lick the sky. The kids dance around, hooting in wild excitement. I expected Ariel to get in there with the rest of them, but she comes toward us instead. She worms her way between me and David and wraps her arms around both of us. She stays there and watches the sparks spread against the sky. Pretty soon, a bed of glowing embers radiates heat to the surrounding onlookers. Everybody relaxes while Officer Tomlinson lights three more bonfires. They illuminate the beach and warm everyone. When my face radiates with heat, I turn my back on the fire to warm my back. Everyone does the same. Friends and neighbors stand around, chatting in low tones. People meander from one cluster of social interaction to another, and the atmosphere settles into a comfortable environment of friends and visitors from near and far. When I look around, I can't help noticing all the people smiling at me. They never whisper behind my back. They never make me feel out of place. If they remember that I got arrested for murder, they don't show it. Ariel pulls me and David closer to her. She hugs us both, and a rush of exhilaration burns through me. I love this little girl like my own daughter, and I don't want to let her go any more than I want to say goodbye to Zach. I look up to find David studying me. His eyes glisten with moisture, but a beatific smile spreads across his face. He leans toward me over Ariel's head and kisses me. I never dared to dream the Winter Carnival could turn out to be such a success. In my darkest hours, I dared not hold out hope for this moment. I held on to my friends and my loved ones. 
They were my lifesavers, who kept me afloat when all seemed lost. That must be why Ariel holds on to us like that. We're her lifesavers. All around me, a giant network of lifesavers and the people they save drifts over the beach. We're all just floating along in the current, saving each other and being saved at the same time. That's us. That's the town that means so much to me. The carolers sing one Christmas song after another. They cover all the old standbys. The crowd joins in, and harmonies drift on the chilly air. Sparks from falling wood scatter against the stars. I never want this night to end, but I know it will. In a little while, Zack and Gilly and Sabrina and I will go home to our house. David and Ariel will go home to his place to spend Christmas Eve before we all reconvene at my house for Christmas dinner. Tomorrow will bring new joys and laughter and camaraderie with the people I love. After that, more challenges will come my way for me to solve. The agony and the ecstasy will never end. That's just life in the human world. I wish I had known twenty years ago what it took to be happy in the world, to embrace the varied human interactions that fill my life with pleasure. I could have avoided years of heartache and loneliness. If I knew in my twenties that I would be living alone with my son at the age of forty-five, I probably would have fallen into black despair that my future life didn't match the fairy tale storybook ending of Happily Ever After. I didn't know then that there is no storybook ending. Life is the storybook ending. It just keeps going on, and I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life. I don't need to be married to a man or copying some template to be happy. I have David and Ariel and Zack and Gilly and all these friends and neighbors filling my life. They hold me up when I fall. They keep me floating on the surface when hardship threatens to pull me under the tide. What a good feeling that is to know I'm not alone and that all these people want to help me and see me succeed. Their faces glow with light and warmth and happiness. All the work I put into the Winter Carnival and the other community events pays off when I see them happy. I'll have to be careful, though, when it comes to sneaking out of bed to fill Zack's and Gilly's and Sabrina's stockings. His insistence that I hang a stocking, too, tells me he plans to fill my stocking himself. If we don't time this just right, we might bump into each other on the stairs in the middle of the night. That would be hilarious. This has been Bubble Chum by Windy Meadows, narrated by Lily Jane.